Okay, Chairman Vaccaro, you can start your meeting. We'll call the uh, meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderman Howard. Present. Alderman Hubbard. Present. Alderman Muhammad. Present. Uh, the woman boy. Present. Uh, the woman Clark Hubbard. Here. Chairman Vicoro. Present. We have everyone here. President Reed. Best committee, everybody shows up. Um, well, we don't need there's nobody to excuse. I'm sorry, President Reed. Here. Thank you. Let's Eight presidents. We have an extra, gosh. Um, so we're, we don't need to excuse any aldermen anyway and uh, take a motion for approval of the minutes of the June 22nd meeting. I move for approval of June 22nd meeting. Second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. How'd you do that? Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Howard. Aye. Alderman Hubbard? Aye. Alderman Muhammad? Aye. Alderman Boyd? Aye. Alderman Clark Hubbard? Aye. Chairman Bacora? Aye. President Reed? Aye. Eight aye votes. Okay, we're gonna start, we're gonna go through, cause Chan's is gonna, uh, Alderman Muhammad is gonna be fairly quick. Uh, Alderman Hammett, do you want to uh, speak on your board bill number 87? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, does everybody have a copy of board bill 87? Yes, I okay. do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, board bill 87 is fairly simple. It is closing O'Fallon Park until January 1st of 2021. Uh, all of you guys know O'Fallon Park is dear to me. We have uh, been uh, remodeling and reinvesting in O'Fallon Park. Uh, while our parks were closed due to COVID-19, uh, people in our community had the opportunity to enjoy the park like never before. Um, I've seen seniors in the park, I've seen children in the park. Uh, and right now uh, with our parks reopening under the mayor's order, uh, O'Fallon Park is becoming what it used to be prior to COVID-19. Uh, so I want to continue investing in the park, doing repairs on playground equipment, uh, continuing to read the renovations at the historic bow house. And I want to make sure they remain safe for everyone to visit that stays in the community now. Uh, so what I want to do is close the park until January of 21 next year, uh, not only because I want the park to stay safe, but because right now people are not respecting uh, the social distancing uh, orders that we have encouraged and implemented here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, it's a bunch of illegal activity, drug sales, um, and speeding cars through the park. Uh, it's just not safe, uh, uh, not for residents, and it's not safe as far as anyone's health. Uh, so I want to make sure that people respect those guidelines. So uh, this board bill simply closes the park uh, until January uh, of 21. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would take questions if any member of the committee has any. We can go down the list, or does anyone have a question? I don't. I don't know that anyone has a question. Does anyone have a question for Jan on this? Uh, Alderman Muhammad on this one. Alderman I do. Howard? Okay, yeah, sure. Alderman Howard. I just. I. I, I guess what I'm. I, I'm kind of confused with uh, uh, Alderman uh, Muhammad. All the parks were closed to vehicular traffic. Mm -hmm to to spare the COVID. Did that mm -hmm. not happen in O'Fallon Park? No, that, that definitely happened. And when all the parks were closed, we had road barriers that prevented cars from getting into the park. Now those barriers are gone, cars are getting in and it's just bringing in more traffic. Uh, so it oh. with, with the gates not being there, it's an open sign to people just to go in. When the gates were up, uh, the park was secluded uh, and it was safe. Uh, and it was uh, it was free of just this girl like activity, right? Yeah, I just I, I, I it just seems as though 
you know, it would serve a purpose to get people out and in fresh air and have uh, people walking, you know, but they, they keep tearing down the barriers. So you're closing it. I, I understand. I, I'm not questioning your decision. I'm just questioning, you know, a little more behind it. So it's your park, sir. I understand. I'm sorry that's happening, but okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Any other Thank one you. for questions? If not, we'll take a motion to pass this bill out, uh, pass board bill number 87 out, unless someone has a question. So, I move. I move that. Move. Okay, we got to move. We, we move. And we have a second from President Reed. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Our previous roll would work. I don't think there'd be any. Does anybody have an objection to the previous? Uh, wait a, uh, well, never mind. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, none. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I request previous roll. Okay. I don't see any objection to the previous roll. So having done that, we'll pass that out with a due pass recommendation. Um, the next thing we're going to do, just because it, it should be quick, uh, if, if Alderman Oldenburg wants to speak on Resolution 24, we're not going to vote on that today. We're going to have another meeting on Thursday, but maybe he can give us just a, a quick overview since we're moving this to Thursday. Certainly, um, certainly. Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I will be quick. I, I think today's agenda for Resolution 24, it's members of the committee, is really just to set the table with um, uh, the resolution and what we hope to accomplish. And then on Thursday, the chairman um, and others were gracious enough to, to schedule a what will, what will be taken as public testimony uh, at 10 a.m. Thursday morning. So, um, you know, I'm happy to entertain some questions today, but let me just give a quick overview of the resolution. I think it was September of last year that the uh, CSP group came and, and delivered a presentation to this committee uh, regarding uh, area-wide surveillance and wide area motion imagery and how that technology uh, can really enhance the, the uh, cameras that we already have, the real-time camera footage we already really have uh, built from an infrastructure standpoint in the city. So this technology, of course, um, sends planes up, as you may be familiar, and they, they, they fly over the city and they're taking constant uh, images, uh, which, which have been proven to uh, be able to trace, trace just pixels, uh, not identifying anyone uh, along their face, uh, their race, their sex, anything. Uh, it really just, um, it captures a, a, a pixel or an image that takes place at a certain crime scene. And then you're allowed to um, using, enhancing the cameras that we actually already have in place in St. Louis, um, work in concert with the, the, the area wide imagery um, to identify where, where we might go and question uh, suspects, people of interest, folks, witnesses, folks who might've been at, a, at any particular violent crime scene. Um, I won't bore you more with the technology. I'll have a, 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 a subject matter expert on, on Thursday to kind of defer all technology questions. Uh, the, the upshot really of this resolution is to say, look, we know we have a violence problem in St. Louis. Um, we know yeah. that we need to try um, any and all aspects and avenues um, that will reduce our violent crime and our homicide rates and that solve uh, crimes leading to arrests and get justice for victims. This is the other component, I think, to this technology that needs to get talked about more is there are so many victims that, that um, are touched by the violence in St. Louis and they're seeking justice just like anyone else would want. And this, this provides a crime fighting, a crime solving tool uh, that, that can deliver justice to, to, the, to those victims, their families and, and, and their friends. Um, the, the, I think the, the important thing also moving forward is um, this resolution really just urges and says, let's get the adults back in the room um, with the folks who can provide this technology and the police, the technology officers, uh, the public safety director, uh, the chief of police, and to say, where are the pitfalls that exist in potentially pursuing this? All this resolution does is let's urge and nudge um, uh, more formalized conversations around where they were last September uh, when they came to town to introduce this. 
And additionally, in speaking with my colleague from the Eighth Ward, uh, I think a broad-based community awareness um, and acceptance of this is absolutely a critical component. Uh, so I, I'm open to even acknowledging in, in the resolution uh, via an amendment before Thursday to say, hey, this every step of the way, we should make sure that there's oversight uh, from, from the community and that they're being involved in this uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, the cornerstone of our constitution, right, that civil liberties aren't, aren't in some way being violated here. Uh, the courts have already ruled uh, that they are not. There's settled law on this. Um, I suppose there are those who will argue there's an appeal and that it's not settled, but we have to still continue to govern, uh, despite what may or may not go to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the other great component to this um, is that there, you, I think there's the ability for um, it to be free for several years. Uh, that there could be donors that, that, that could be identified to help us provide uh, this technology to the city. And moreover, if it doesn't work, we can have a clause in the contract or the memorandum that says uh, violent crime hasn't been reduced by 30% and we're going to try something else. And it really just cost, um, you know, uh, some man hours that, that, we, that we are trying to do anyway to solve crime. So I'll, I'll close and, and answer any questions um, that you may have on what this resolution does. And moreover, we can have a more substantive conversation and testimony from folks on Thursday. Uh, any questions? We can go down the list. Alderwoman Howard? I have no questions. Uh, Alderwoman Tamika Hubbard? No questions at this time, Mr. Chair. Alderman John Muhammad? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just have one question uh, uh, for the Alderman. Uh, Alderman, in terms of, so I, I get the concept of the bill, I get it, but in terms of securing privacy, how would, what would be the process and protocol for that with this particular uh, uh, project or program? Yeah, no, and that's a good question, Alderman. I, I mean, I think we, when you get to the next step of are you securing a contract or a memorandum of understanding with this vendor? Um, when do you put those? When do you put those safeguards into place? And they absolutely have to be part of that. I would agree. We have to make sure that this data is housed by uh, either the police or professionals, and that no way that this data could surveil um, um, someone that that's not related to a, a crime scene. Um, or a police investigation or, or an investigation by the, the circuit attorney or the courts. So uh, I'm also in, in favor of sort of acknowledging that in this resolution, if, if, if you're happy with it, you, you wanna work with on some language that says that needs to be part of if, and again, the word is if, if any kind of um, substantive agreement or arrangement comes together between uh, the police, the administration and this vendor. I, I wholeheartedly concur with you, sir. Thank you, Autumn. I have, I have no further questions. That's my biggest, that's my biggest thing with this particular uh, resolution or just this entire, uh, you know, idea is how can we, you know, guarantee privacy rights uh, for residents and for citizens. Uh, but I definitely get the idea. I, I, I do think the program is needed. Uh, I just want I just want to make sure that the program uh, is done right. So that's that's all I have, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Alder. Thank you, Alderman. Alderwoman Pam Boyd. No questions. Alderwoman Shamine Clark Hubbard. <laughs> she got the best one. No questions. Thank you. And I have no questions, so we're going to set that Mr. aside. Mr. Chairman. Maybe. Yes, sir. Uh, is it okay if I have an opportunity to ask a question? Oh, you know what? How did I? I apologize. Uh, that's I didn't okay. start at the top of the list. <laughs> Vice Chairman Boyd, I apologize. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm very interested in this project. Um, but uh, Alderman Onenberg, I was wondering if you will be communicating or you will allow the Community Justice Coordinating Council to participate in these discussions. You know, we spent a lot of time last year working on that legislation and putting that group together. I think it would be very helpful. And we do have uh, Debbie Allen, the, the executive director of that, um, of that, that council as a participant. And I'm curious if she would, uh, she, may she, maybe she signed up for comments, I don't know. But would you mind if she made a few comments? Not at all, not at all. And, and Alderman, I would say in terms of building a broad base uh, community awareness and support of this, that 
that that are that that group and that team needs to absolutely be part of this. She she's actually signed up for comments on board bill number ninety two. Okay, um, would and, it be okay if she made comments on the resolution, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, as long as she keeps it short, only because the amount of okay people we uh, have, that's not a problem. Um, I guess she's on with us. I saw uh, her somewhere. Thank you, Alderman Boyd. Um, Alderman Alderberg, I very much welcome um, collaborating with you all on this initiative. You know, as Alderman Boyd mentioned, as part of the ordinance and the charge to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council is to ensure that the proper sharing agreements are put in place between the entities for which information and data is gathered and shared. And so what you're describing falls squarely into um, a kind of agreement that would need to be put in place. Um, and we certainly can help um, this committee uh, craft the proper agreement so that everybody knows the legal boundaries, policies and practices that need to be wrapped around this to ensure privacy and the proper use and dissemination of this information. So, and on that council is all of your criminal justice agencies for which the, um, the creation of that data that you're um, describing would impact. So um, I welcome that participation. And yes. um, we welcome giving you any expertise and hope that you would need to create that, um, that proper agreement. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And in fact, it, you know, I, I'll, I'll add some more acknowledgements that uh, the, the CJCC needs to be <clears throat> part of this and, and we can move to those subsequent agreements that can be attached to those future conversations um, again, with the with the police, the mayor, and the vendor, when they when they begin, just taking the initial steps at potentially crafting an arrangement. Agreed. Yeah, and I would welcome you back Thursday. We're going to really go through. This is going to be the main and only topic. Well, I'm not only, but should be the main topic on Thursday. I appreciate you giving me prime time, Alderman. Uh, Alderman uh, Vice Chairman Boyd. Any further? No, no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to set this aside. We got a uh, public safety meeting on Thursday. This is going to be public testimony, and we're going to work through that. Um, so what I'd like to do, um, I'm, the only reason I'm holding by state to the end, we're going to have quite a few speakers. Plus, we're going to have to come up with some thoughts on how we're going to help by state through this. So we're going to take up Board Bill 92 next. Uh, 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 President uh, Reed, do you want to go through? And, and, and what I will say on that, and I got the list of speakers, uh, and I will say that even including Dale Glass and Debbie Allen, uh, I'm going to get, you know, Kyle Reed, and I got four speakers, we're going to give them five minutes apiece. That's 20 minutes. Um, and so hopefully, you know, otherwise, you know, if we're here, we'll be here forever. And we have six speakers for by state so i would ask that the speakers on this kind of hold it down to five minutes and i would ask the clerk to uh, time that out so that we're doing this fairly timely uh president reed you want to go ahead and give us an overview and yes thank you mr chairman and members of the committee board bill 92 is a board bill that sets out that calls for a plan to be put in place and sets a timeline for the ultimate closure of msi uh, also known as the workhouse uh, msi was built in 1990 in 1966 and when it was built it's a two-story facility and it was built to house 1,138 inmates. But, you know, over time, we've seen that population drop for various different reasons. And now we're down to under 100 detainees currently being housed at MSI uh, at a cost of $8 million a year, if you look at just this year's budget. Uh, part of the uh, what has helped to lower the population and raise awareness of what's going on at the at, uh, workhouse is we've had local advocates who have called for the closure of the workhouse for numerous years, but the most organized effort has been put in place by the close the workhouse campaign in more, more recent years. Some of the members of the caucus that are uh, on this uh, meeting uh, call today 
probably remember years ago when we were working with then Alderman Greg Carter to go down to the workhouse and to assure that the conditions were humane. And we found all sorts of issues and we worked with, uh, I worked with the uh, facility managers and the corrections director to address some of those issues firsthand, uh, but still problems remain. Um, so what this board bill does, uh, this board bill directs the commissioner of corrections to begin the process of closing the medium security institution as a detainee holding facility. Uh, the commissioner of corrections under this board bill will be directed to review all contractual obligations specifically related to housing of detainees at the MSI uh, and determine the amount uh, of notice the city has to give in order to end contracts and the cost associated with those contracts up to the date the contracts end. Uh, he will also compile a list of city employees uh, that are currently working at MSI, their salaries, and work with the human resources director to try to move some of those current employees to uh, other open positions that maybe we have within our city, within various different departments around the city today. Uh, it also um, is calls on them to contact any facilities within the state of Missouri that has available spaces for detainees and determine the cost of outsourcing the housing of detainees currently in MSI. It also calls on him to determine a monthly average uh, of detainees in MSI for the previous, across the previous 12 months. Uh, and what the plan also calls for is for this to be done in a safe manner, a manner that uh, will preserve the safety of, of the citizens of the city of St. Louis, but also create a, a more humane uh, uh, and a, and a, and a a more sustainable system, uh, you know, that could replace the current system that we have in place with MSI. Uh, and we do that for a much, you know, more effective cost uh, than what we would be spending uh, under this current facility. We have 10 amendments. Part of what this will do also is create two funds from, from the savings that would, um, come off of closing MSI to address neighborhood safety issues, to address uh, re-entry programs so that uh, people who, are, who have been detained and coming back out you know, into our community uh, will have all of the programs and services in place to assure that they do not reoffend. Because oftentimes we just cut people loose and say good luck and they end up back in their same community and with no opportunity for for growing, no opportunity for jobs and all these other things that will keep them from reoffending. So we need to assure that we have the programs and services in place so that they don't reoffend, right? And if we use this money uh, that we're using currently just to keep MSI open uh, in a more effective and efficient manner, I think we will see a safer city, a better city. And I think we will uh, see people who have formerly been detained coming out and leading productive lives. So that gives you a general overview of the bill. Uh, we, like I said, we have 10 amendments. I think most of the people on the committee who I've had an opportunity to talk to, most of you have reviewed the bill and uh, understand it. So with that, I'll just take any questions. And I know we have a number of speakers uh, that are, that are coming on to speak also. So would you prefer the speakers before the amendments? Like, do the, or do you want to do the amendments and and then listen to the speakers? Uh, we can we can do the amendments if, if you would like to do the amendments. We can do the amendments first. I will, uh, I will defer to my vice chairman. What do you think? Do the amendments? I, I, I think it would be helpful to do the amendments, in, in my opinion, so that we have the whole bill before us. Okay. and people that have testimony to give, it may provide insight on their testimony. You even sound like a DJ. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, Mr. He's, President. He's using this very white voice today. I'm because, telling you, he's got that. Deep, deep voice, his radio voice. <laughs> Morgan's got the 
<laughs> anyway, uh, Mr. President, why don't you go ahead and let's start with amendment number one to okay. board bill 92. All right, uh, first is everybody have all the amendments in front of them. They should have been on the Google Drive. Uh, I know the, the clerk put them out there. So, and there should be a total of 10 of them. So amendment number one to board bill 92, it amends said board bill uh, page four, line three to page four, line three as follows. Beginning on page four, line three, strike out the words jurisdictions and insert the following words in line thereof. Public detentions, detention facilities that meet federal detainee standards. And that this amendment is important because again, uh, the federal detainee standards are a standard we should certainly strive to meet. Uh, and this assures that the facility is a facility that, uh, that uh, meets those baseline standards and that will be a humane facility. Okay. Uh, do you wanna vote on the amendments one by one or do you want to save them? I guess we just, why don't we vote on them as we do them? Yep. So uh, I'll, I'll make a motion we uh, uh, vote amendment, amendment one. Yeah. yeah, number one. Second. Oh. Is there a previous roll? Anybody? Previous got? roll. Okay. Having, we're good. We'll move on. Amendment number two. Amendment number two for board bill ninety two. The amendment uh, uh, is this. Starting on page five, line one, to page five, line one, as follows. Beginning on page five, line 11, strike out the words 180 days from the effective date of the beginning of this ordinance and insert the following words to read in, uh, in words and figures as follows by December 31, 2020. Okay, any questions on amendment number two? I do, you said that's page five, line 11? Line one. Line oh, one. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, the second, the second line of, on that, it, it says line 11, but it should say line one, page five, line one. Okay, okay I see. Never mind. Okay, okay then we'll, we'll take a motion for amendment number two. So moved. Second, I'll second previous roll. No objections, previous roll. Let's do number three. Okay. Thank you all. Amendment number three to board bill 92 to amend uh, said board bill page five, line three uh, to page five, line seven, uh, page and also page six, line two as follows. Beginning on page five, line three, strike out the words, the vision of recidivism uh, reduction and insert uh, in line there of uh, the vision of supportive reentry. And this, this is that fund that I spoke of earlier uh, that will help with reentry re um, of people who are formally detained. Any questions on amendment number three? Seeing no questions, I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. Previous roll. Let's go on to amendment number four. Uh, amendment number four for board bill 92 to amend um, said board bill page five, line six to page five, line six as follows. Beginning on page five, line six, strike out the words that have been determined to suffer from mental illness and insert the following whose contact with the criminal legal system is determined to result from certain social de uh, determinants. Uh, of crime, including mental illness, substance addiction, substance addiction, a, a, addiction. addiction, excuse me, <laughs> poverty, and highly co uh, correlated social factors. Hmm. Any questions on amendment number four? Hearing none, I'll make, take a motion. To so move. Second. Previous, previous roll. roll. Hearing no objection, we'll move on to amendment number five. Hey, amendment number five uh, uh, for board bill uh, 92 
as to amend said board bill, page five, line eight to page five, line eight as follows. Begin on page five, line eight, strike out the words uh, from mental illness and insert in line thereof the following from certain social determinants of crime, uh, including mental illness, substance addiction, poverty, and highly correlated social factors. Any questions on amendment number five? Hearing none on, we'll take a motion to accept amendment number five. We have a motion for- so uh, so Second, second. previous roll. Here, no objection to the previous role, Mr. President. Let's go with amendment number six. Amendment number six for uh, board bill 92 is the men said board bill page five, line 15 to page five, line 17 and page six, line four as follows. Beginning on page five, line eight, strike out the words neighborhood crime reduction fund and insert uh, in line there of re-envisioning public safety fund. Okay, do we have a motion on, any questions on amendment number six? Do we have a motion on- Move to adopt amendment number six. Second. Previous okay. roll. Here, no objection to the previous roll. Let's move on to amendment number seven. Amendment number seven is to amend said board bill, page six, line seven, to page six, line seven, as follows. Beginning on page six, line seven, strike out the words established by neighborhood organizations of each fund funded neighborhood and insert the following and lie thereof in which uh, neighborhood residents develop community generated ideas and intervention uh, interventions around improving public safety exploring cost and feasibility and put those ideas to a community vote any questions on amendment number seven Hearing none, we'll, we'll take a motion to adopt amendment number seven. Move to adopt amendment number seven. Second. Previous roll. Hearing no objections, Mr. President, move on to amendment number eight. Uh, amendment number eight uh, is to amend said board bill number 92. Um, to amend the board bill, page five, line 20, to page five, line 20 as follows. Beginning on page five, line 20, after the words fiscal year 2021 budget uh, for MSI operations, insert the following figures. And in subsequent years, the 7.6 million currently allocated to the city's, uh, to in the city uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, budget for MSI operations, in addition to one half of the revenue derived from any contract of uh, to house federal detainees in the city of St. Louis facility. Any questions on amendment number eight? Very good. Uh, so we'll take a motion. Someone so make moved. A Second, previous roll. No objection to previous roll. Mr. President, uh, proceed with amendment number nine. Amendment number nine. Nine to yeah. up here. Hmm. You guys are going to have to thank me in the end. I'm doing all this without my glasses because I couldn't find oh, them. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're somewhere in the house. I couldn't find them, but I'm, okay. I'm, almost, I'm, I'm the almost done now. <laughs> to amend said board bill, page five, line 16, to page five, line 16 as follows. Beginning on page five, line 16, before the words, the comptroller is authorized, insert the following words and figures. A with a uh, right parenthesis. Okay, um, any questions on amendment number nine? Hearing none, we'll take a motion to adopt amendment number Move to nine. adopt amendment number nine. Second. Previous roll. Hearing no objection to previous roll, Mr. President. Uh, let's give us number 10, your final amendment to this bill. Okay, uh, amendment number 10, actually um, it's Tom online with us and may have him go through amendment number 10. Because amendment number 10 is a very long amend amendment. Um, okay, you're, you're wanting Tom to give it to us? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go through it, I'll go through well, it. Well, Tom can. Amend 
I'll go through it. And can I can go through it. Um, well, you want to uh, just cover the highlights? Well, uh, well, what uh, we had to determine since we were running so uh, behind the timeline, it, we were going to that uh, amendment since it was. I don't. Easy. I don't think it's on on my drive. Right. Of course, yeah, it's not on the drive because it was okay. so lengthy. It's just we're just going to introduce it as a separate separate ordinance on its own. I mean, yeah. So, it's, so the other amendments nine and ten, we're just going going to introduce as a separate. Okay. Um, well, then we did nine a separate was, ordinance. Yeah. So so that'll be a different. So so you're done with your amendments then? Yes. Yes. And, but, I'm sorry, uh, Alderman woman Howard, go ahead. Uh, I guess if we did nine, we need to take that back if that's going to be part of this other one. Is that correct? Yeah, Tom, are you it was nine just uh, adding that section A in front of the language? Yes. 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 That one we, we don't need to do. That. Okay. All right. We'll scrap nine because, um, again, amendment number 10 is a, it's, it's so long that it, we might as well introduce it as another board bill. So we're going to introduce that as another board bill because it outlines uh, how participatory budgeting should work and all of these other things are very complex amendment. So, so we'll need, we're we'll going to, yeah, we'll, we'll need to, we'll need to, uh, I move that we, we motion. I, we want to take, I, I move that we strike down amendment number nine. Second. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Wait a minute. So we, we, we adopted it. Wouldn't we have to reconsider? Um, we can vote to reconsider, or we could just vote to uh, to strike down. Okay, well that's easier. Okay, yeah. I I support that. Did you make a motion? Yeah, I did. I, yeah. I second. Oh, Howard made. All right, previous no, roll. Second, I seconded. Okay, and, and, and here no objections to previous roll. Let's go on to board bill number ninety two as amended. I know there's three speakers, including uh, Dale Glass, I would say I would appreciate everything. Mr. Clerk, please time them. I'd like to keep the speakers at five minutes and under just because of timing, because we have all the bi-state people that uh, I really want to work with them to figure your stuff out, so. Mr. Chair? Yes, yes. I, I just have a question. Do we have a board bill in front of us with the amendments? I guess not at this point, right? No, uh, you have the amendments and you have the board and bill. Have the board be, bill. Okay, yeah, they'll be integrated okay. once we vote. That's on. fine. Okay. Thank uh, you. So, Mr. President, you want to bring the speakers the way you want, or you want me to bring them on? Uh, go ahead and bring them on. You okay. Them. Well, now I guess where I set that at. I set the list. We just start with Dale Glass. Um, sure, and then by then I'll find my list. I, oh, here we go. I got it. The way the order that they were given to me started with Debbie Allen, Dale Glass, okay. Taylor Reed, and Blake. Yeah, so let's do it like that. That sounds good. That order. So, yeah, De uh, Debbie Allen, you're you're first. And again, please, five minutes or under, if you would please. And um, and and we're gonna go that on everybody. So, thank uh, you. Debbie, if you go ahead. We're thank here. you, Alderman, and um. I just wanted to acknowledge also President Reed and thank him for this, uh, the submission of Board Bill 92. I think it starts a much needed conversation. So I appreciate your leadership in that. Um, I submitted to the committee my testimony in writing. So, cause I knew we were gonna be limited in time. So I believe that all the aldermen women have received a copy of it. So I'm just going to just um, start reading and just really kind of highlighting what I think are the important pieces. Um, so when, when we reviewed, we meaning uh, Judge Mullen and I reviewed Board Bill 92, we um, wanted to bring to attention to the committee some language change that needs to happen. So I'll start with that. Um, in review of section eight of Board Bill 92, where it talks about the criminal justice coordinating council and the tasks that the uh, bill contemplates, um, that language presents challenges for us. First of all, the city's criminal justice system is comprised of federal, state, and local agencies so that these agencies could work together across the different legal interests for which they hold, 
the, bold, the Board of Aldermen passed Ordinance 71012 and the mayor signed into law in August of 2019. That ordinance established the council as a separate legal corporate politic, allowing the parties, federal, state, and local parties to come together under a shared vision and purpose. The chair of the CJCC cannot compel any of the city, state, or federal agency to assist in the closure of MSI. That is, out, that is outside of our purview. And secondly, while the CJCC was designed to facilitate information sharing, it is not an owner or legal custodian of the operational data for which you seek, such as jail custody, arrest, incident, court, and et cetera. The CJCC has established agreements with the various data owners to use the, the data on limited purposes. Any ability to support bill, board bill 92 would require agreements with the relevant criminal justice agencies for the purpose defined in the bill. So we would need to change the language to um, reconcile the, those challenges. I also wanted to point out that the CJCC was also designated to facilitate capacity building and consensus to transform the legal criminal justice system through data-driven policy and fiscal decisions. The scope of work includes identifying more effective evidence-based services that support individual behavior change, as well as promoting new justice system policies and practice that better align resources to promote public safety, harm reduction strategies and healthy communities. Certainly Board Bill 92 speaks to those sentiments. I wanna to get to that, because um, my testimony is um, lengthy, is when we think about the closure of a city jail, we need to think about the impact that it will have on the entire criminal justice system, including federal, state, and local agencies. We need to think about um, understanding the jail utilization. We wanna look at who is in your jail? How did they get there? How long do they stay? We have subpopulations. And how often do they return? Without knowing some of these basic facts, leaders such as yourself cannot know how to best endorse changes, such as the closure of MSI. To help organize this conversation, it's important that we start with an impartial analysis relying, relying on data from the multiple criminal justice agencies needed to understand the characteristics of the pathways into your jail. I talk about in my testimony about front door, side door, back door and revolving door. And I'll let the, the members uh, read to that. Last week, when we heard about board bill 92, circuit court judge Mullen, Mike Mullen, who is the chair of the CJCC directed me to bring together the existing resources that we have put in place within the CJCC to conduct an impartial study to help, ben, to help support the Board of Aldermen in their decisions that you are about ready to make. So with that said, we do have the agreements in place to receive the data that you will need so you can see that big picture overview of uh, who is coming in your jail, why they're there, how long they're staying, and how often they're returning and, and really critical data metrics such as that. We expect that it would take us 45 days, although that could be lessened with the support of the Board of Aldermen. Chairman, that's high. If you could please wrap it up. Um, sure, sure. So um, we will begin that study and we hope to deliver that to the Board of Aldermen within 45 days. And we hope that the insights of that report can help guide you in your decision-making related to Board Bill 92. Thank you. Um, so Commissioner Dale Glass, again, please, five minutes. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll save my comments to the end, but uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Glass, uh, you're up if you're here. Commissioner, are you with us? Mm 
Madam Clerk, is the commissioner, is Commissioner Dale Glass with us? I don't see him. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on and hopefully he comes back. Maybe he had something come up or a bad connection. Kayla Reed, uh, you're next up on the list. Uh, thank you, Chairman of Caro, and thank you to the members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Kayla Reed. I'm the Executive Director of Action St. Louis, which is one of the partners on the campaign to close the workhouse. Um, first, I'd like to start this conversation by extending you know, gratitude to President Reed and his team and all the alders who have supported the call to close the workhouse over the last two years. Um, this is certainly um, a momentous occasion for our campaign and uh, the city at large. We are grateful for the intentionality that went into this bill and that you all have adopted the amendment set forth by the campaign, um, which we think in, will make this uh, bill a lot better uh, and in service of helping our communities. And so um, I rise to ask that you vote this bill out of committee um, so that it can go to the full floor with the adopted amendments. Um, I think that the parts of this bill that really speak to the goals of the campaign are the creation of the division of support and entry uh, that we create opportunities to not um, have a revolving door, that we actually create um, opportunities to keep folks out of our jails and out of the criminal legal system and invest in them so that they are able to uh, thrive in our communities. Um, and also the creation of the Re-Envisioning Public Safety Fund, which has always been a core tenant of the Closed Workhouse campaign, that we would reinvest the resources that come from the closure um, of, of the MSI uh, and invest them into communities that are severely impacted by violence in this moment. Uh, these resources are desperately needed. Um, we are excited that this process will be participatory and that folks who are directly impacted by these issues are able to, um, to convene and learn and vote on things that they want to see invested into their communities. Um, and that we are doing this process um, in a way that is that has been transparent uh, and accountable to the public. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and the uh, special meetings that I know you all are approaching your break uh, that you are going to have um, to get this done. And the campaign just uh, wanted to rise and, uh, and, and relay that gratitude and also urge you to vote yes on board Bill 92 in committee and on the full floor. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, I do think Commissioner Glass is on the phone. I, he sent me a text. Is he with us? I, I'm going to assume that text came from him and said, I'm on the phone now. So we're going we're to move on. Uh, you know, so Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, if you ask him what number he's dialed into, then maybe well, I, don't, I don't know if that's him. It just says I'm on the phone now. It doesn't let me look because it doesn't identify. It says Joe, I'm on the phone, and uh, I don't know if there's somebody's cell phone number, so I don't know. Let me here. Hang on. Let me text back to this number. In the meantime, why don't we go ahead, Blake? Why don't you go ahead? And give me the, go ahead and start your testimony. Give me the opportunity to make sure that this is a number that, you know, I don't want to publish somebody's number if I don't, you know. So, so while I'm doing this, Dale, Dale go ahead and, if you would, please. Sure. That, me, right? You want me to go ahead? Yeah, yes, please. Okay. And this is, his, this is Dale Glass, but let me make sure I get his number out. Uh, well, th good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will be very brief uh, because I think Kayla said it well. Um, I also want to thank President Reed and his team for um, moving with urgency and in, in, um, uh, presenting this bill and um, to it and the amendments today in committee. Uh, we are glad to be able to work with President team on these amendments, which uh, I agree, help to strengthen the bill and help to really make sure that we're achieving the desired outcomes. I also want to thank all of the um, alders and other members of city government that have been um, uh, in support of taking this step over the past many months um, and, and few years. Uh, we're at a really critical moment in the country and in St. Louis. Uh, when people are calling for different kinds of solutions to the problems we face. And those problems 
are very urgent. And so I think it's appropriate that this body's moving with a level of urgency in um, uh, passing out board bill 92. And I hope the committee members will take that today and support the bill on the full board. Um, I also agree that the, one of the most critical pieces of this legislation is the re-envisioning public safety fund, which will put much needed dollars into communities that have been hard hit, hard hit by violence, hard hit by crime and hard hit by incarceration. Uh, and those communities are very much deserving of this investment. Um, and, and I look forward to seeing how this process plays out in a resident led way. So um, with that, I don't have much further to add. I certainly encourage everyone to support this legislation and thank everyone who's had uh, a role in getting us to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Mr. President, uh, this is I'm mute. Dale's saying that he's muted. Apparently he's here, but muted. Let me, let me, uh, rather than three digits of his phone number, uh, 7791. Okay. Um, may I make a suggestion since I've had nope. to do these uh, Zoom meetings? What you might want to do is unmute everyone and then have Dale speak. And then you'll know who. Sorry, there's no, there's no phone in callers listed in the attend in the uh, panel. Right. So Right, so this is Debbie and I have that problem yeah. when I conduct these meetings. So what I do is I unmute everybody and then have that individual speak and then I know who to not mute. Um, let's see here. Hang on, what about, what about five, well, no, because what about 5848? Eight? That number is in the attendees list, which could be part of the problem. Okay, and that's, that's going to be Dale. All right, so I've unmuted. This is Dale. There we go. Okay, okay Dale, you're, you're there. Uh, you got five minutes of fame. If you can kind of tell us what you got on your mind, and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair Committee. Um, I, I really don't have much to, to indicate. Um, uh, obviously, the uh, city asked me to do a task, President Reed, and I'll, I'll do my best to bring uh, information to help them form their decision. I, I, I would uh, indicate that uh, a couple of misnomers, um, at no time has um, the federal U.S. Marshals indicated that MSI was not suitable for their prisoners. Uh, we follow um, NIC, National Institute of Corrections, ACA, uh, American Corrections Association standards, which would be the same that the U.S. Marshals would follow. Uh, that being uh, put aside, um, the only thing that I would indicate is that the, the goal of <laughs> going to one jail uh, is, is something that I uh, have been aspired to since I got here in 2012. And um, I think that at our current number, the rest of the uh, community or partners and advocates are noticing what we've been able to accomplish with the help of a lot of uh, uh, support uh, from the community. Um, and now it's worth a conversation because the numbers are where they are. The only thing that I would do is um, indicate that when you when we get down to looking at this closely uh my concern is that uh i don't have the luxury of ignoring the fact that 860 beds does not indicate that you can put 860 people here and i won't bore you with all the correctional jargon and why that is uh, i usually try to make it simple but i can go into detail at some point like indicating that for example, one unit ha has 64 beds and 28 women, but you can't use the rest because anyone else in the division are men. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that we have to take into consideration. The other caution that I would indicate is, for example, the governor just signed the Omnicrime um, bill. So I have to look at how does that impact 
uh, our local jail. Um, there have been a number of jails that um, um, across the country that have um, done a number of uh, jail reforms and, clo- and, and a couple of them actually closed their facilities only to find out later there was an uptick in arrest and then having to go back to the very jail they abandoned and then try to prepare to receive people. Um, so, you know, I would indicate, and, and, and then I'll, I'll cut it short, I would indicate that when I got here, um, the city's situation was such that at MSI in a dorm, there were 70 people in an area that had space for 35 and only had four showers and four toilets. So I tore those beds out. It reminded me of a scene from a movie. Uh, the people were uh, sleeping so close that they could literally reach across and touch the next person. The last thing I would see would want to uh, see here in the city is because uh, we didn't get this right. Um, we end up with people sleeping on the floor and all those kinds of things. So those are the cautions that I I present as as we move forward, and I'm uh, a- an anxious participant to uh, examine where we are today. One final thing, when you look at uh, my website and it talks about the number of people or our count for the day, understand that that's what's on my count. That does not include all the people in the building. Uh, Prior to COVID, for example, there are at least another 100 people in the building, um, not intended to have rooms, but might be holding cells but they have to use the facilities and all that factors into uh, the various uh, issues we look at when we talk about facility capacity versus functional or operational capacity. And so um, I'm looking forward to embark on this, this uh, project that I've been given and I'll I'll have to reach out to other uh, agencies in the city because some of that is outside uh, my expertise, but um, That's all I have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Glass. Um, Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go down the list. Uh, I'm gonna give a fast, my comment. I, you know, I I was not, I'm not, uh, I was not a big fan of just overnight close the workhouse and move everybody. I will say that I do plan myself personally to support this bill because it looks more into how we're gonna do it and gives a timeline to try to get it done. And, and I would commend the president for, for that. I don't think I could have supported just overnight, shut it down, figure out what to do after the fact. So I'm gonna go down the list. Um, uh, uh, Vice Chairman, any questions on this? Yeah, um, here's one thing that I wanna make sure that is, is very important. I want to make sure that those people who are part of the criminal justice ecosystem, you know, like the members of the CJCC are intimately involved in this process and that a report is done first before we get too anxious to move forward. It, I think it's critical um, that we have citizen input, but I think that um, the professional people who deal with this on a daily basis, their input, those experts, um, input is critical to this process. And I wanna make sure that we don't miss a step. I know this is something that has been um, sought after for a long time with closing the workhouse. Uh, I'm not for you know just housing people. People should give, be given second chances, but I do have trepidation about this process if it's not done really? in harmony with everybody especially the CJCC. We have to make sure that the judges are involved, the circuit attorney's office involved, every entity that's involved in this ecosystem is involved and has a seat at the table and are listened to. So that's what's important to me. I'm gonna vote for the bill, but I wanna be clear that this is not just one person's bill. This is, is in my mind, a community's bill. And a community's bill in a way that Everybody that works inside city government is protecting the rights of all citizens. Don't come. Really? What is it that you want? Yeah. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I agree. And, and, and as this goes along, we're, we're going to be monitoring and having meetings. Uh, if that's all, then uh, Alderwoman Howard. 
I agree with um, Alderman Boyd on the points he brought. I, I guess my my concern is we're in an unprecedented state right now with the COVID and, and all of that's going on. The criminal justice system is in flux. Um, I, I feel as though we need to have longer, harder conversations with Mr. Glass, um, this, uh, the, CG, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Um, I have a lot of questions and I, I think of the, that we would have more conversations. I think we could probably answer those. I am a little concerned about moving forward here and putting timelines, you know, I know what, what I guess the board bill says now that the MSI would be closed by um, December 31st, 2020. I, I'd like to have a conversation around that. Is that realistic? Um, you know, we have uh, detainees that were released because of the COVID. Um, you know, right now there's uh, the, the courts are on hold. Um, and and I, I, do we have a false number here? Are we gonna need this later as, as Mr. Glass uh, referred? I think it's, I think we need to look at this closely, but I think we, you know, we don't wanna shoot ourselves in the foot over it. Um, I, I would like to have some more conversations around this with all of those involved, um, if, if that's possible. Mr. President, um, would that be possible? Uh, that's part of what uh, Mr. Glass is going to do, because remember, uh, Dale Glass is going to put together the plan. As a matter of fact, uh, he's reported to us that he's already started that process, right? Uh, the bill is structured so that everybody's involved, CJC, CJCC, Dale Glass, and all the other uh, departments that, uh, that should have uh, a voice in it, will have a voice in it. But ultimately, the plan uh, would be a plan that has been structured by Dale. Uh, the first thing that he will do is work to finish that plan and gather any data that he may need. And then he was going to come back and he's going to present that to the Public Safety Committee. Public Safety Committee will be able to ask any direct questions of him and to, uh, you know, ask for any adjustments in that plan, right, uh, based on, you know, other knowledge and other information that maybe you may have gathered from your constituencies or other departments uh, that, uh, that uh, want to weigh in on this thing. So there's going to be plenty of time for discussion, uh, but that's part of the planning process uh, that, again, Dale Glass and his team have already begun looking at. So I guess my question would be, are we putting the cart before the horse here? Um, would it serve us better to have the discussions before we put something into ordinance? No, um, they, and no. have them on board and, and amenable to everything we're, we're putting in here or, um, I mean, no. I don't know what, you know, we're working in isolation no. uh, under no. these constraints. No, the, the board bill itself calls for uh, the planning process to begin, right? And it sets uh, some timelines in place so that we can assure that the planning process will happen. Um, you know, uh, you know, Dale Glass and his team have not uh, said that the timeline is too aggressive and it's one they can't meet or any of those things, right? Uh, and again, the plan's gonna be the plan that comes back from Dale Glass. So, so what this board bill does is that it requires them to begin moving forward with that planning process. If we do not have the board bill in place, then there's no motivating factor. No motivation. And uh, the plan may or may never happen. Kind of like cure violence. We're still waiting for that to be rolled out. We put the funds in place last September at the Board of Aldermen uh, and they, they're sitting there. Meanwhile, we have kids getting shot up all around our city. Oh, and, I, I, yeah. And, uh, I and, we're, we're just sitting here hoping against hope that one day we will see those programs we put in place the way they should have been. Okay, and then one more question, Mr. President. Um, the uh, funds you're referring to, those would be the funds that would be brought in, to, brought identified from closing the MSI? Is that yes. what you're proposing? Yes. Okay, yes. I just want to be clear on that. 
Yeah, and those funds will be able to go directly to helping, um, you know, pinpoint issues within all of our prospective communities, right? Um, and um, again, the other thing is, we have an opportunity with all of the employees that are sitting out there to transition them to other budget line items and other departments around the city uh, that, uh, that have these open positions, right? We have the open positions, we fund it for them on one side, and we also have uh, you know, all these MSI employees uh, that we fund it for on the other side. So the human resources director will work with each and every one of them and the department heads to see if we can reposition and move them to uh, other permanent jobs. And some of them, that'll be a whole new career move for them. And it'll open up uh, opportunities for them that they currently don't have and, and haven't had. I guess my concern is having that drop dead date at the end of the year. Um, at, before we've actually studied to determine if this is something we can do. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a co-sponsor and I'm, I, we need to look into it, but I kind of, I'm a little concerned with that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's and currently, all. and currently again, MSI, I, you know, Dale hasn't said that that date isn't achievable. Right. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's easier for them now with the lower population in terms of the number of people, just the sheer number of people they have to transition around, right? Uh, but it also gives them an opportunity to put in place a system that will allow some expansion depending on what happens uh, and depending on, you know, our ultimate needs in the future also. And I guess that brings me back to the beginning. Are we, are we in a false sense here because of the COVID and our, our small population. I, and I, that's something I don't know. And I don't know if, if, if that's been addressed. Um, if you think about the, the people that were let, let out for COVID, right? Even with those numbers, right? If you take all those people and put them back in there, right? And with those numbers and the, and the cost and the cost that we're spending on an annual basis, we're still way beyond what the state average is. The state average cost to uh, house an inmate on an annual basis somewhere in the neighborhood of $22,000 a year. Right. Uh, and, you know, we are somewhere in the neighborhood of what, 80 some thousand dollars a year. Some, it's a crazy high number, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Dale Glass and this department, they've done a tremendous job of working with the court system to drive the population down. And, uh, um, you know, I trust that they're going to be able to bring forth and, a good and plan. He, and he's made improvements there at MSI that, you know, uh, back when I took office, uh, I, I took one of those trips there and, and it's it's much changed from what was 10 years ago and, and it's much, it's it's more humane. But I, and then on the other hand, if we do get rid of this, is our, our inmates gonna be housed humanely at the Justice Center? That's my other concern. Well, he, he, he would put together a plan that not only includes the Justice Center, right? Uh, if, you, if you remember when he gave his testimony, he talked about reaching out to surrounding facilities, right? So he will put contracts in place, I'm assuming, with other uh, surrounding facilities within our region, right? Uh, to help uh, for, you know, that ebb and flow of, of the growth and the reduction in popul in uh, detainee population over time. Have we considered the cost of that and the cost of transporting these people back and forth for court and whatever they may yeah. need? Yeah, all of that are all of that, like the cost of it, all of those things are part will be part of Dale's plan when he brings it back, right? Uh, and he's going to present that plan to this committee, and this committee will have an opportunity, will be like one of the first entities to have the opportunity to review the plan and be fully debriefed on the plan before it's put in place. Okay. Again, the thing that concerns me is the, the drop dead date of, of December 31st, uh, if anyway. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. You were very good about answering all my questions. <coughs> thank you, all the one. The woman to make a Hubbard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. 
And I definitely thank you, President Reed, for uh, taking leadership on this issue. I, I know it was a very uh, difficult decision for you because it's a difficult decision for me right now because up until this point with all the information that has uh, been out there, we know that you know we, we needed a plan and, and, and this puts a lot of fire under us to come up with a plan, but I, I definitely um, caution us about moving so uh, fast, Gordon. I definitely echo some of the sentiments of Commissioner Glass because those are real issues. You know, this issue may feel good to a few people and at January 1, when they can just say, oh, the workhouse is closed, but they are not looking at the impact that that could have on offenders. Uh, if you look at a, a, a low level medium security inmate who may get arrested at, for shoplifting at Family Dollar, do we want him housed at MSI next to a murderer? Though you have to look at all of those things. And, and if by chance, we um, get an uptick in our numbers and we have to make some drastic changes because I, I don't care. This process is fast. There's, there's, I won't say there's no way. And I know Commissioner Glass will, will probably take the charge and do what he needs to do, but it's a very uh, hard decision to, to move forward and move forward so fast. And I just hope that as a city that uh, we're willing to up some money and do whatever we need to do to accommodate this fast paced move that we are making at this time. And so um, I just would like to say that, you know, this may be a win for some, but it's not a, a win if this has a, a bad impact on us as a city. And I would really caution us about the notion of um, having other entities house our offenders because you know what, they are still our offenders and the police, uh, the Missouri prison uh entity got sued for doing that when they shipped inmates to Texas some years back for due to overcrowding. So, you know, I think if, if we walking in to a plan saying that, okay, if, if we have to, uh, if we need more space, then we may have to ship people around. That's not good for the offender and that's definitely not good for us as a city. So I, I definitely support a plan. Uh, I, I will support it. I will vote yes for this, but I feel that we are moving fast. I feel that um, as leaders, in some ways, we are succumbing to a lot of pressure that has been put on us. But I understand that in, in times like this, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. But I just want everybody to be aware of uh, what position that we are putting ourselves in as a city by moving so fast. And once again, I do thank you, President Reed, and I thank members of the committee uh, and members of the board who we've been going back and forth with this for, you know, some years now. And, you know, we are being forced to make a hard decision and we're making it. So uh, just know that we are going to have to deal with this decision that we are making. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alderman. Thank you so much. Alderman uh, John Muhammad, any questions? Alderman John Muhammad. He may have stepped out. Uh, Alderwoman Pam Boyd. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, the people that are on the, uh, on the close the workhouse, they know my views and know where I stand. And so I guess my question is, and I've always asked about a plan. So I thank the president of the Board of Aldermen that came up with a plan because that was the first thing I asked when they approached me. What was the plan on how this was gonna look? But I guess my question is, because my heart is heavy for St. Louis because we're acquiring all these big, huge, empty buildings. 4,300 Goodfellow, that's gonna be a vacant building. And so, and I kept asking, what a, what's the plan with this building? What, what are you going to do with this building? Or do we have to have guards stand and watch this building so it's not windows broken out and broke in? Will the utilities have to stay on? Well, uh, and we talk about the prisoners. And so I think people keep making all these suggestions of, putting money in these desperate communities, but how is that going to look? Who's going to oversee to make sure the money actually get to those communities? And so when these people get out of incarceration, they're not going back to the community that caused them to get incarcerated 
with the daily properties, the, the education, the no job. So I'm agreeing with my uh, uh, other older people. You know, I did say I supported closure, but I kept telling them we needed a plan. I said, you, you just can't say you closing it and then it's okay. And then I kept looking at, well, you got people that were, were able to walk around in that jail, but when they get here, they won't. They'll be locked up for 23 hours. So that's all I'm asking. You know, it's, it's not just a one quick fix. It's a whole process that has to be addressed. I applaud Dale Glass because he has been diligently trying to improve the conditions and make things better over there. But I just hope that we have a plan that everybody has input and make sure that people are treated humane all the way around. I don't think you said close the workhouse and that's the fix all answer because there's other avenues that you have to look at. So that's my whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alderwoman Boy. Thank you. Alderwoman uh, Shemaine Clark Hubbard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think everybody knew where I stood. I was in support of Close the Workhouse. I'm definitely in support of Floor Bill 92 as amended. And I definitely believe even in work that he exactly what he said. Anyway, so thank you. I look forward to be a willing participant on this process and this plan. And um, again, thank you, Mr. President, for your work and your team's work on Floor Bill 92. Thank you so much, all the women. I think we've gone down the list. Uh, Mr. President, if you want to, you want to give any kind of a closing statement and I think we're going to go yes. ahead and vote. Yeah. There was one more amendment, amendment number 11 that's on the drive um, when we were shuffling around and wiping out those other amendments. We, uh, And amendment number 11 uh, for board bill 92 reads like this. Uh, to amend uh, said board bill line, uh, page five, line one to page five, line one as follows. Beginning on page five, line one, after the words that by December 31, 2020, insert the following. This plan will include, uh, will include neither construction of new facility, detainee facility, nor repurposing of any existing construction. A structure as detained as a detainee facility. So do we have a motion on amendment number? Well, now it so, says eleven. It's really nine. Yeah. So what this would mean is that that the MSI structure is down there. We will we will repurpose it for something else. Right. We're going to use it for for something else. Um, and they're you know various different ideas already being floated. Um, you know, I know Mark, since introducing the board bill, I've gotten, you know, tech, not text messages, but emails from constituents that said, oh, that'd be a great facility for, great uh, piece of property for, you know, a host of things, right? Well, we, so we'll entertain a motion for amendment number nine to board bill. So moved. Do we have a second? Uh, no, we have well, questions. I, I do. Um, so it's, it's on the drive as a as amendment number eleven because we. I I, I, I had some questions about it. So let me, well, I'll um, go down the list and we'll start with uh, Vice Chairman Boyd. Okay, Mr. President, explain this amendment again. I'm I'm trying to go on the drive to get it. Explain what. Okay. It, uh, it should be on the drive as amendment number eleven. Uh, you want to pull it up? Okay. So essentially, all I'm saying is that uh, you know um, uh, that the current facility, right, the, uh, will not be uh, repurposed, right, uh, and so we'll use that facility for something else, or um, you know, put it on the market or whatever, right. Um, so it 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 uh, it just you know it's just talking to that current talking about the current building. Well, I, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, I do too. That there is uh, so we're saying that the 
commissioner number one has to come up with a plan within 45 days that that that's heroic if that happens um and now we want to say that we cannot repurpose that building for any reason whatsoever no what this, I'm, I'm not supporting what, that. what what uh what it what it's what it talks to is it says okay the whole plan cannot be just a plan to remodel that building right and make I understand that building that. better it, it, that's what it does for the plan right so so the plan that we get back has to be a plan beyond just the repurposing of that of that current facility but i understand mr. if you have so mr president if you have an issue with it, i understand but mr president I, I number one i think that is 45 days is a very, very short window to collect all the data that needs to happen in order to move in a responsible manner. I would hope that if the 45 days is not achieved, that there's some extension process, there's some kind of safety net on extending it because we want to make sure that we have the most accurate data possible from the experts, the people that are actually working daily in the system. Um, I don't think that we should just say um we're gonna just do nothing with this building and maybe sell it to somebody we might need it again and i think we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we say hey we'll never be able to reopen this as as, as a uh, jail or we'll never be able to or, or reopen this to repurpose it to maybe um be a facility where people can transition from uh the state system um to i forget what, what they call it when they um no it can be used for all of those things it could it could be used for all those things and a plan could be uh, and as part of a plan dale could talk about some of those things it just uh you know like you know uh, as part of the plan itself the plan itself can I come back and say, okay, it's just for detaining? Well, but, but but why would we put short pants on people? Why would we just mm -hmm. say, you know, we don't want a, we don't, don't bring us a plan that says ABC. Why would we want to do that? Why wouldn't we just let the system work? And why wouldn't we just let, you know, the CCJC, CJCC group and um, everybody that's working at ecosystem, why don't we just let them do their job and come up with some recommendations? Why would we want to say, don't bring us this? No, we, we are, we are, we, no, we are, we are allowing, we are allowing them to do their job. Uh, right. What we're, what this amendment speaks to is just to say that through the plan, right? Um, the plan must think beyond just, okay, we're gonna remodel MSI and just keep it in place, right? And, and here's the thing, here's the thing, I almost guarantee you that, that Dale Glass would agree with that. Dale Glass isn't, isn't, uh, isn't uh, one to say, okay, we're just gonna remodel this and, and keep the things there. He's been working on this process for, for a while. This language just lays out that as part of the plan itself, the plan has to think beyond just uh, the repurposing of uh, MSI as a facility to detain, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, to keep, you know, a, 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 a detainment facility, right? So there are a host of other things that it, that the, that the building could be used for and repurposed for that will help uh, the city, right? That will uh, also help in transitioning uh, from um, detainment into, you know, the, uh, you know, into the, you know, back into their normal lives. Uh, but again, this just says that, you know, the plan has to think beyond just remodeling that building and keeping, uh, keeping the 96 people there or 100 or whatever. But, That's all it does. But, but why, why do we have to say that? Why, why? Uh, because they, <laughs> all the men, because you know as well as I do, uh, you know, uh, when we um, it, when we're putting ordinances together, um, uh, you know, you know, and, and I'm not saying this about Dale Glass, because I don't think Dale Glass, if Dale Glass is making his own decision, doing his own thing, I don't think Dale Glass would move this direction. But it could possibly, you know, um, uh, 
this just makes it clear that we're looking for a, a, a broader plan, a, a plan that, that, uh, that transition us, transitions us from the MSI and allows us to operate more cost effectively uh, and more humanely in a system that is more in alignment with uh, a 2020 system, right? Uh, so that's, that's the only thing this does is just say, hey, you know, it's part of the plan. Don't, you know, don't come back and say, oh, we're going to throw $300,000 in the MSI and, and, you know, give it a fresh coat of paint and clean it up and change some things within it. Um, you know, because, uh, again, uh, I think there should be very little doubt that we can operate more cost effectively and more efficiently and utilize the tax, the, the, the tax dollars of our citizens in a, in a more effective manner and get those dollars out to the communities that the various different aldermen serve, especially aldermen in North St. Louis who are dealing with just, you know, um, just out of control, uh, 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 you know, crime rates in some of the, some of the neighborhoods in our, in our city, you know, um, so, that's all this. That's all this does. But I understand your trepidation because you want to, uh, you know, assure that they have as broad of broad of canvas canvas as possible to to lay down that that plan, right? Um, right. And I and others do also. You know, um, we're just saying, you know, to clarify things. And the transition our city to the next step. Just assure that that plan does not include just the repurposing of, of that facility, because otherwise we've all wasted a whole lot of time talking about it. Okay. Mr. President, do, do, um, let me ask you this, and I don't want to insult you, and I don't, want, ins I don't want to insult uh, you, you're not, the class. You're not. <laughs> But I, I just find it hard to believe that Commissioner Glass would come back and say, you know, let's just paint the place and let's just, you know, I agree. do whatever. Um, I, I am concerned about this. First of all, this bill is moving extremely fast. Um, I'm not sure why we have to do it right now. Um, a process is everything. You know, um, I've been down the board for 17 years. And, you know, we've had to deal with some real crucial, difficult issues. Uh, Civilian Review Board, for example. The Civilian Review Board took years to get into the works. It took months of community input on trying to make that bill the best bill that it can be. And now, all of a sudden, the whole close the workhouse, it's got to be done like right now. I'm not even sure December 31st is realistic. And the reason I say that, and I'm not against the pro this, the reason I say that is because, again, we're putting short pants on a process. We're saying, hey, I don't care what happens. By December 31st, the workhouse is closed. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that's the best way we could, you know, craft this legislation. I I'm concerned that we may back ourselves into a corner. Again. 45 days is a very short window to come up with a plan. There is absolutely no plan right now. So what we're asking is to create a plan. In order to create a plan, we need the experts in the field to help create a plan. And that plan should come back before the Board of Aldermen, and then we should have some more conversation about it. But, you know, like I said, um, when this conversation came up a couple of weeks ago, I, I'm not for a hard stop. I'm not for a hard stop on closing the workhouse. I want to make sure we do our due diligence. I want to make sure that we're responsible in the decision that we make in this process. Um, I, I, I support this bill, but I will, I, I do it with such trepidation and, and I'm not even cautiously optimistic. I'm scared that mm -hmm. this is going to, it's just going to be railroaded, you know, and, and the workhouse is going to close and we're going to have a mess because no, no. we did not take the steps that we need to take to do this right. There is no reason that we need to do this right now. 
I mean, I wish COVID-19 would end, if I could predict it end in August, and we can have everybody in room 208, and we can look at each other and talk this thing through a lot better. But right now, Mr. President, this is a rush job. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, but I know that it's something that we need to do. I support closing the workhouse, but I continue to say I support closing the workhouse in a very responsible manner. I am concerned that we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot and, and I, I can't even get the amendment. I don't know what's going on, on my computer or the Google Drive, but I can't pull the amendment off. But based on what you said about the amendment, I, I can't support this. I, I don't think it's fair to the people who will be working on the plan to present it to us. That's just how I feel. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. So um, to answer a couple of those questions, when um, Commissioner Glass came on and gave his testimony, he came on and gave his testimony after reviewing and reading the, the bill in its entirety. He also gave his testimony after being in communications with uh, people from our office about timelines, what they're currently doing and all of these other things. And um, uh, what he did not say in his uh, testimony was that um, he could not meet the timelines on, on, this, on, on that are set forth, uh, that are set, laid out in the board bill. He did say that he was very excited uh, to get going, right? And matter of fact, and fair disclosure, he has already begun some of the work. Uh, I do believe that, uh, that Dale Glass is competent, capable, and qualified. And I think we're lucky to have him here in the city of St. Louis that, that, and that he listens, uh, right? Uh, to, uh, you know, he, you know, all of us, right? And he, he has always been pleasant to talk to and uh, has always worked to um, uh, assure that St. Louis uh, is properly housing the detainees. He uses the budget line items that we send over to him as, as, you know, as efficiently and effective as possible to address the, the needs uh, within the system. Uh, I have every confidence in the world that he will uh, achieve uh, what uh, what is what you know? What we need him to achieve under the guidelines of this board bill. Otherwise, he would have just stated it right out. He would have said, "No, that's not achievable. I can't do it. It's, it is impossible. It cannot be done." Right? I think that we are. I think that we are uniquely positioned right now for him to actually achieve that because of the decrease in population and things of that nature. Mr. President, and, with all due respect, I did not hear uh, Dale Glass. I mean, he didn't sound very enthusiastic to me he when he just testified he for five minutes. He, he testified for about five minutes or so. Um, he has some cautions. And yeah. that's why I want to make sure that they have a reasonable amount of time to really work through and deliver a plan to the Board of Aldermen that it's practical. That's all I'm saying. I just want to make sure he has a reasonable amount of time and let's not put short pants on the process because that's counterproductive. I think we should, matter of fact, options. I hope it's not just one plan, but it's some options. On, hopefully on he can, can hopefully, walk out of the workhouse. Yeah, hopefully he brings back some options, but all of that's going to be up to him. And then finally, I'll say this is that uh, we didn't just start looking at the workhouse. I mean, you, I, all this, we've been we've working on this for, I know I've years and years and years uh, dealing with the workhouse, right? Uh, you know, if you remember back when they didn't have air conditioning down there, right? I was down there pushing and requiring that air conditioning be put in there, right? And that's the kind of stuff. Sometimes as the administrator, right, you are limited uh, in terms of your ability to push back on the administration that you actually work for to move the system to a new place and a better place, right? So what this bill does, it actually empowers him to say, you know what, bring your best and your brightest ideas to move us to, to, uh, to another place, right? He does not have that power under the, under the current thing, right? Because it's based on what the people above him are directing him to do. But because of, uh, you know, um, uh, Section 25, uh, you know, uh, we have the ability through a two-thirds majority vote to empower 
department heads in this way. And that's what we're telling them. And like he said, he said, look, I'm looking, looking forward to getting going on it. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, like, like I'm telling you, they've already begun the work, you know, and then even CJCC, uh, if you think back on her testimony, she said that she actually has, they actually have gone and taken the step to put the agreements together, the intergovernmental agreements together with all the other data agencies so that now they're prepared to collect and assimilate this data uh, uh, that we will need uh, to support whatever plan that will come forward. Wow, so, so you, you believe that we can dictate um, to the administration on what their employees will do not believe, um, not believe. I know it's, okay. it's, it's, so, it's based on it's based on the charter. The charter, right. the charter empowers uh, the board of aldermen. Uh, if you look at uh, section, I think section twenty five okay. uh, of the charter, you'll see it. It empowers okay. board of aldermen through a bill like this to to have the uh, have the directors uh, move forward in the planning or something like this. And this is what this bill does. <laughs> Okay, Mr. President. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Oh, um, uh, Alderman Hubbard, I, I recognize your hand, but I'm gonna do it, Carol, and then I'll come to you. I didn't, I didn't I'm not, I'm not ignoring, I'm just gonna go straight down the list, but but thank you. Uh, Alderman Howard, you had questions? I guess my, 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 my concerns are the same, that <clears throat> we're talking about a study and a study would inform us as what needs to be done. Um, my concern is the same as the as Alderman Boyd's. Um, if we get to a place and the study says, you know, we have how many murders on the north side the last month? Thirty one. We have nobody talking. What what if the, the winds change with um, our our initiative with? Um, oh God, pure the violent. one that the, pure, pure violent. violent, and we're able to make some arrests and we're able to hold some people accountable. I, I, I think that, you know, we're in a false sense of not needing this. I'm not saying that we don't need to look at it, but I think to put deadlines on this and, and, and close the door on any other conversation is really cavalier. Uh, we have uh, in front of us here from uh, CJCC, a report that will be available in 45 days that looks at all this information and I, I, I agree, we do need to look at closing the workhouse, but I, I think we need to not paint ourselves into a corner and then find out maybe we should have looked at some other, uh, you know, some more things. I, I agree that it's, it's worth looking at and we, we need to have a plan, but I don't think that um, being this, uh, impetuous, I guess, in, in doing this. And I'm, I know, you know, people have been looking at this for a long time, but we're just starting the conversations with all of the entities. And I, I would feel more comfortable if we could have some more information gathering. And I'm not confused about this. I think that we need to do it in a deliberate and, and communicative manner. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. I'm uh, yeah. oh, um, thank, thank you, well, Mr. I mean, Chair. Are you going to comment? We, Mr. we still have by state too, so I want to move. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Uh, All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. So the amendment reads this plan will include neither construction of a new detainee facility nor repurposing of any existing structure as a detainee facility. I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot support that. Uh, I don't know uh, who added that in, who crafted that language, but to me, it lends to this notion that, that they are trying to address uh, prison reform and mass incarceration by way of closing the workhouse. How, how can we predict as a city that at some time, we may not need additional space to house uh, offenders? And I, I believe wholeheartedly, Dale Glass is not going to try to, you know, paint up the workhouse and fix it up and spruce it up and then open it back up. That's none of our plan. We know it's an issue. That is not our plan. And having language like this in the board bill 
really uh, ties our hands to say we can't open up another jail. They, they want us to have a one jail city, but if our crime dictates a two jail city, then that's what we have to do. And I'm, I'm sorry, I support the bill, but yeah. I am not in support of this amendment. And I would encourage uh, members of the committee to not support this amendment because I think as a city, this puts us in a very bad space. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you will, um, I'll withdraw this amendment. I'll withdraw this amendment because I know you all have a, you know, another big bill uh, pending. So I'll withdraw this amendment. And like I said, uh, you know, in my statements, um, I think Dale Glass is going to do a tremendous job. I don't think Dale Glass uh, will bring forth a plan like that. Um, but um, uh, this was a, just another safety precaution to assure that uh, there isn't a push for him to do that and uh, him not being able to have anything that stands behind him that says, you know what, the, I cannot do that because of uh, what's been laid out in the bill. So I would, I'm happy to withdraw that amendment at this time um, because we'll have an additional discussion uh, on the floor and we can decide um, whether we move forward with this amendment at all. Uh, even when we hit the floor. Plus, I'll give me some time to talk to the individual members to see if there's some tweaking in this amendment or if we just don't need it on, at all whatsoever. Uh, especially when, you know, you have uh, some folks uh, that have been, you know, very forward thinking in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, working with me on other legislative issues um, that, uh, that uh, maybe the community wasn't behind yet, but they took bold steps in helping to move those things forward. And then eventually the community and everybody else came on board at a later, a later date. When they throw up caution, then I think it's, uh, it's reasonable to just hold for now. So I withdraw uh, the final amendment. That's fine. So let's, let's just kind of move on. I think what we'll do is uh, we're gonna go down the list even though we didn't finish, we'll go down the list again on committee, uh, I mean, on uh, Board Bill 92 as amended. I will just add real quickly that, you know, I agree about timelines, but I do know that myself and Alderman Hammond have tried things on, on redistricting, trying to get the police to go around. And it seems like, oh, we're, we're going to do something right away. So we say, okay. And then all of a sudden nothing happens and then we're having to reintroduce something. I do feel that if they at least have a part of a plan or most of a plan in those days and they need a little bit more time, I'm sure we can work on that. But I, but I do think that timelines, because uh, I've been burnt a few times with saying, okay, well, you guys work it out. Anyway, that's my only comment. Let me go down the list on the on the board bill as amended. Uh, I'll, Vice Chairman Boyd, any comments? Nope, you're, you're muted. Passed. You can come back to me, please. Okay. Alderman Howard. Carol, you're mute. You're muted there. Can't can't hear. Can you restate what we're voting on? We're voting on Board Bill 92 as amended. This is, we're not really voting on anything at the second. We're just concluding this so we can get the by state. Uh, but this we're is not just, just any, 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 we're going to vote on this. But right now, it's just if you have any other questions on Board Bill 92 as amended. No, I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay. All the women, Tamika Hubbard. No question. Alderman John Mohammed. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Alderwoman Pam Boyd. No questions. Alderwoman Shamine Clark Hubbard. <laughs> no questions, thank you. And I said I would come back to the Vice Chairman. Vice Chairman, did you have any other comments on the bill as amended? Um, I, I, I just want to say that um, I would hope that we as a body, if we see a train wreck coming, we would stop it. I would hope that if we can't make 
the these deadlines that we come back and we amend the bill and extend the deadlines. Um, so that's all I will be asking um, with my vote on the passage of, of this bill out of committee. Um, I will be paying very close attention. And I promise if I see that these deadlines are not being made, I'll be the first one to introduce a board bill to amend the board bill because I want to make sure that we do this right and we get it right the first time. And we're not putting short pants on the professionals. People have been doing this for 20, 30 years. So I just wanna be clear with that. I wanna be on record. I will introduce a bill to amend this bill if it looks like the 45 days and the December 31st deadline turns out to be unreasonable. And I will hope that I can get the same amount of support on that as the support is being given today. Thank you. And I will support that. So, and you know, I will. So at this point, then let's just go ahead and, uh, and, and need a motion. If anybody wants to make a motion to vote out uh, Board Bill 92 as a I move to I move to um, approve Board Bill 92 as amended out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. Second. Okay, and uh, does anybody have a problem with previous roles? Hearing no problem, Board Bill 92 as amended is passed out. I would like to thank everybody for all the participation. And uh, so the by state people. I want to thank everybody to too, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Just let me say thank you to all the members of the committee and um, everybody that joined the meeting today to hear the discussions. I really, really, really appreciate and thank you all so much for your support uh and and and, and uh reginald howard um uh, from by state i think he was oddly enough one of my students uh if you want to unmute yourself i i i'm sure it was a pretty tragic uh time but uh, and i was surprised when he told me I, that i was one of his students because i wanted to run and hide because I thought I was a terrible teacher, and I know I was, but I thought, you know, I could hide. Anyway, so what I'd like to do, and hopefully we all stay together with this, we need to send a strong message to by state. They're telling the workers after they've had two people die, two of the bus drivers die from the coronavirus, and they've had multiple people that have uh, caught the uh, virus and for the safety of the, the drivers they had gone to where they got on the back of the bus well now they're saying no we want them to go on the front and to pay when they go on uh, at this point it is is collecting that little fare worth risking those drivers and I, I I think we have to send a strong message to the head of by state and even consider holding back the tax money that's given to them if they feel that endangering the, the uh, bus drivers and the workers is, is, is just not the way to be. So I thought what we would do, and, and, and uh, Shameen, uh, Alderman Shameen and Alderwoman uh, Tamika, uh, I think what I'm going to do is basically um, like you, since you're the ones that had sent me this, uh, do you want to go down the list of speakers first, or would you guys like to comment or explain what maybe the thought process might be? Uh, I can comment, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, our representatives for the um, union for Bass State for being here. Um, it was conveyed to me that there was some issues regarding um, the treatment of the drivers and in light of COVID-19 and everything that's going on. And I too know that, you know, um, when your workforce has some uh, discontent with how you are handling things, when um, several members have, have died, have succumbed to uh, COVID-19, I think it was like two or three bus drivers. And I know a lot of bus drivers and they constantly uh, tell me some of the issues that they are having and specifically right around this time. And so I felt 
um, that it would be good for us to just revisit. I mean, they they have been on the radio. Uh, the NAACP is in support of their efforts regarding how they are being treated in light of. And I feel that us in our official capacity, we do need to send a, a message to them. I don't know if that's something that would be by way of resolution or sometimes just a conversation. And when people know other eyes are watching it, then it tends to make them treat people um, a little differently. And so that's all my uh, comments that I have on it. I definitely would like uh, for them to have a moment to express themselves on what the real issue is uh, regarding how uh, their our, their workers are being treated in light of COVID-19. So uh, um, at this time, I guess if anyone else has anything to say, I'll, I'll just yield. Well, what I think, I think if it's okay with, with all the women uh, Shemaine Clark Hubbard. I think what we'll do is go down the list of speakers, and uh, and 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 I would ask the speakers to uh, maybe let us know what you'd like to see from us. I can tell you, the board of aldermen, everyone I've spoke with, is one hundred percent behind you and understand, you know, the the uh, issue that you guys are facing. So. Um, I think what we're going to do is we'll start down with the president of, of the uh, local 788, uh, Reginald Howard. Uh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for giving us the opportunity to speak today on this situation. This issue really is a concern that we have is, uh, with Bi-State at this time. Uh, like you said before, is Around, you know, this thing is we've been going through this thing since March when it really hit us hard on uh, this COVID-19. And, you know, through fighting through it, we, we had started boarding the bus from the rear instead of having them, the people come past the operators and without possibility of, of trans, you know, contacting this disease. All, all of a sudden, Metro by state took it upon itself to say, OK, uh, we're going to start sending people back through the front. I think it was around June the 1st um, and taking and reducing the fare. We still have a problem with that, you know, especially now. Especially now, with the numbers increasing, the way they're increasing as far as COVID and, and bringing the people up through the front door. You know, we are, people are scared. You know, they're, they're, they're really scared of of this disease, you know, and, and we got one guy, we got one guy off right now for refusing to board someone off the bus because of they want them to come through the front. And he had lost two people in his family recently from COVID. So I understand that uh, him being afraid and, and he has the right to refuse. So what Metro does is they, they constantly want to go back and forth with us about the social distance. When they first started talking about opening the uh, economy back up, before then, I have a constant conversation with them about social distancing on that bus. They're carrying a seated load, which is about 40 people or somewhere around there on the bus, and some of them have a standing load. So you got people sitting on this bus shoulder to shoulder in this bus that is a closed-in box with no ventilation. We here recently got them to start wearing masks. At first they said, we request you to wear a mask. Now it's required they wear a mask, but then some people get on there, you know, they pull the mask down, blow their nose down their chin. So, you know, you're still in an enclosed box and through different studies and things you see on the news and everything is on how far the droplets travel. So you still got the, them at risk and they're afraid of contracting this thing. And I'll talk about it personally myself because my son about a month ago had tested positive COVID down in Denton, Texas, where he goes to school at. So this is something that's very, very scary to me all the time with this. And I want Metro, Metro doesn't see it that way. And we need some help if we can to kind of get the message over to them to where it, it'll bounce back on us to where we make our people more safer, feel safer and everything else. Thank, thank you. Uh, Sherry, are you with us? Yes, I am. You wanna go ahead and, again, uh, 
I think we understand the, 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 the problem, but you sure speak on it however you want and what you would like to see from us, uh, because I can tell you we're willing, we, we can have a resolution in place. Um, there's a meeting again Friday. We can have a resolution in place by Friday's meeting, um, potentially even, well, it'd be hard for tomorrow because the timing, but possibly for tomorrow. Well, I'm, first I would like to thank you uh, for making, allowing by state to be inclusive in your meeting today. My name is Sherry Lemons. I've been a driver for 12 years. I am going to speak upon what happened May 30th of this year. I had, we were still in the process of allowing passengers to come in the bus from the rear as well as exit the bus. And one particular passenger uh, he did not have a face covering or a mask on. And I'd like to address people as ma'am, sir, miss. And I said, sir, excuse me, you cannot ride the bus without a face covering or mask. He was very calm. He did not use profanity. His mere words were, okay, okay. This gentleman proceeded to walk to the front of the bus and he shot he shot at the bus intending to shoot me um he was interviewed by officer hayes and another officer that was there at the, at the time he wasn't but other people were interviewed and they said that he stated that he was trying to shoot the driver. I found out later through a five page police report in which it took me time to get it, that it was a nine millimeter uh, gun. And this has truly changed my life. Uh, all because of I'm trying to keep the passengers as well as myself safe from this silent disease in which can also turn deadly. And the bottom line, by state tries to minimize their liability towards the workers. Their only uh, workman's comp uh, accepted my uh, case, but by state has not uh, given me a salt pay, which has put me in distress in my own uh, financial uh, duties to myself so far as being able to pay my medical, uh, my union dues, as well as my pension. And I think that they have a bigger responsibility to keep drivers safe as well as get out to the public, perhaps speaking on the intercom, allowing them to know that it is mandatory for them to have face coverings and to keep their distance from the operators. Because if it was not they did implement some things. If it was not for uh, this makeshift shield uh, that they have put up uh, for, so the drivers, it's like a plexiglass that came through the front curbside window. Uh, the bullet hit this plexiglass, which kept it from hitting me. And it has been life changing. I, I would imagine. I would imagine. Um, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, that's terrible. And um, I also know it's terrible. I mean, you see stories about bus drivers getting drug off buses and beat up and everything. I, I would. Um, 
you know, as far as the masks, I, I think we should at least ask the mayor instantly to put out a order saying in order to get on a bus in the city of St. Louis, you have to have a mask. That was scary. And that uh, the drivers can refuse. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm going to be in the mayor's office later this afternoon and I'll ask her uh, to instantly put that out, that that should be uh, something given the bus drivers, if, if they don't have a mask, you don't have to open the door. Um, Can I state this? Um, sure. Bus drivers shouldn't have to be police officers. We, we need for Metro to step up and take accountability because you have too many people out here with mental illnesses and we can do our due diligence to try to keep the passengers as well as ourselves safe. But speaking to certain people, I would have never thought this young man uh, would have shot at me uh, from the looks of him. He did not look like uh, what they would say a thug. He was well-dressed. Uh, a young man between 18, 22 years old, and he was very calm. He was not belligerent and neither did he use profanity. And so I was not expecting that. You would expect that from someone stating, uh, you know, threatening you. But when someone calmly gets off the bus and uh, proceeds to shoot at you, that that was very un, unexpected and metro has to do but they just have to do better is it just like someone stated reggie stated earlier is it worth that one dollar uh the lives of our drivers and to keep us safe from this deadly silent killer well i i know i do plan to introduce uh, a resolution and, and possibly some legislation. I got to check the best way to do it, saying that as long as this COVID is an issue, that people should board the back and not come in contact with the drivers. Then, then uh, I, I know we're going to do something. I got to get with my colleagues, which we're going to do before we end this meeting. And you're certainly welcome to listen to it and, and also. Uh, jump in if you think what we got in mind is good, bad, or indifferent, okay? And then and in conclusion, I, I want Metro to take accountability. I have a five-page police report that says assault, and 20% of my pay uh, should come from the assault pay. And they have minimized that as well as I have, I was representative by the vice president to uh, see why they were not adhering to giving me my assault pay. And um, they stated that it was no physical contact, but this has truly changed my life. I, I just wanna get better and move forward and hopefully this can be something to protect another driver. Hopefully it, it doesn't happen to anyone else. Not to that degree anyway. If somebody shot at me, I would consider that just because the bullet missed me, but that's not an assault. Um, the no. police report states it as well as the interview with officer Hayes. And we could, I would be more than happy in my capacity to send a letter saying that I believe that you should be getting paid that. So we, and, 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 and what we'll do is I'll, uh, make sure you get my, my cell phone, my personal cell phone number. Um, in fact, anybody wants to write it down, they can. My personal cell number is 314-718. 0131 and just call me and uh, we'll do something about that differently than you know how we deal with the masks in the front uh, and how we you know how we deal with something as a board 
Um, so I'm going to move down the list to, is it uh, last name Gilliard? First name Keaton. 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 It, Keaton. Looked, it looked like it. And then I thought, <laughs> I wasn't going to. Anyway, Keaton, so uh, you're our next, next speaker. All righty. So first, I want to thank you guys for having us. Um, on this meeting with you guys. Um, one thing that I was told was the meeting was about the safety of the operators. And I I totally agree with everything that Ms. Lemons has said. And starting off, like, I'm here to protect myself and everyone else around me. So when um, I think he stated that they started it um, June 1 to let the um, passengers through the front door, and then that's when the spike in COVID tests uh, went up in the company for uh, operators testing positive. My main thing about it is, um, no, I do not believe that the dollar a bus is worth any life whatsoever. And the issue that I have with it is, you know, I have family, you know, I have a lot of family and I love seeing my family. We all take the necessary precautions to protect each other, meaning we stay away, away from other people. We really just do, we don't even do Sunday dinner anymore. And that's a tradition in my family. So with my job and me being in close quarters with the public while driving the bus, I come in contact with millions of people that also come in, well, thousands of people that come in contact with others. So my numbers of exposure are very high. So I do not believe we should come through the front door. And they don't. And like, like she said, again, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm a bus operator. I am there to drive the bus safely from A to B. And I cannot babysit adults asking them to please wear your face mask. You, you can get on a bus one day and then you, they'll have their face mask on and you can look back. And it's about 10 people that pull their face mask down. I can ask them, yes, can you please put your face mask back on? But how many of them would do it? And then how many of them would do it and not give you, you know, the extra, I don't have to do this. Why don't you drive the bus? We hear that all day. So I did feel it to be like, that's what I'm there for. I'm there to drive the bus safely from A to B. I don't want to be a, a babysitter. I don't want to um, watch adults all day, making sure that we're all staying safe and playing our own part to keep each other safe. Um, this is what we're, we are going to, before we all get off, we're going to get all the committee members up on here. We are going to, we're going to try to deal with this. So what I'll do is, uh, uh, I'll move on to, to, to Robert Star, Starling. Are you with us? I know some people might have left because we really, the other meeting went way longer than I thought. Robert, are you with us? I think he's not. What about Crystal? Crystal Gilbert? And I see Mrs. Wilson. So Mrs. Wilson, why don't you go ahead for us here? I think I see a back. Oh. Um, so Ms. Wilson, you're, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. You can't. Am I unmuted? Can you're you hear me? Unmuted. You're unmuted now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us and thank you for taking the time to work with us. We truly need your support. We have so many issues going on with Metro currently. We're not only are we fighting through this front door service. One, we feel like not only is it a issue for our operators, it's a public health issue. Because each one of our operators come in, less with, come in contact with no less than at least 100 people a day, some up to four to 500. 
anytime you have this number of people having face-to-face -face contact, we know how this pandemic starts um, and we know what we need to do to slow it down. Our thing with Metro is if, you know, they're saying, oh, wait a minute, we need the money for from the fare boxes. There is no way that I believe, and the reason that I left my office where you first saw me and came to one of the facilities is because I wanted to share something with the board. I want to show them um, how Metro is using money. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the camera. This is a metal detector, which was purchased with the CARES Act money. What they're saying is these are temperature scanners. When they told us about these Model B uh, temperature scanners, we told them immediately, these are metal detectors. So my point of showing this and how the money is being wasted and there is so limited oversight with the decision makers at Metro right now is um, just to show that we have, if they have the ability to use CARES Act money to purchase $10,000 metal detectors, there's no way they should have opened the front doors up on these drivers. So what we're asking the board to do is to come out and help us out with this. The, the dollar fare, just the, the putting the fare in place, the face mask, we know that the face masks are needed, but what they do is they initiate additional conflict for our operators. Metro's response time to help our operators on any given day out there is 25 to 40 minutes. So while you have an operator trying to persuade a passenger to wear a mask, uh, the operator, they're being assaulted. And then when they're being assaulted, and then when they're being assaulted, they're being, uh, Metro's denying them a contractual right that we have in our contract to uh, for assault pay. And what assault pay is 80%, I mean, it covers the 20% that work does, comp does not cover for our members. So again, we're just asking for the board to come out and help us with Metro. We know their public sector transportation and we know their dollars come from city, state and local funds. There's no reason to put the people, the taxpaying citizens of this region at harm for a dollar fare when their standard protocol is if the, fare, if the customer does not have the fare to allow them to ride. So again, we just thank you for having us and we appreciate all the support that you've given. Well, thank you. Um, so the members of the uh, committee, can you guys pop up on the screen? So I know who all's with us here. Um, I wanted to go through a couple thoughts and then I wanna go down the list of thoughts. But one of the things that sounds to me uh, that we should somehow at least try to get a the 20% hazard pay for all the bus drivers. I, I know they're doing that in different places and you know there, there should be hazard pay for driving them. Um, you know, is, is one of the things, I think we need to do a resolution. I also think, in, in my opinion, we need to send a very strong resolution, which we could have together by next Friday, asking for the 20% 20, 20 hazard pay. I think that, um, you know, uh, I think we should ask in that same resolution for the rear door entrance to not have them use the front door. Uh, they, they need to pick something. I, I can tell you, first off, I couldn't drive one of the buses. You'd know if I did, because every stop sign and everything would be knocked over, especially that reticular bus that's about the length of a train. I would run everything over. They'd say, hey, Joel's, Joel's driving the bus. Um, so I'd like to go down the list. Uh, and I know some of, some of the other people had to go here and there. Um, is, is Vice Chairman Boyd still here with us? Well, I see Alderman Howard. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, resolution, or do you have something that you think we could do that's strong? I, I think that, you know, our health commissioner, I mean, to me, allowing these people to get up, and I, I, I understand, if you, do, you have, do you have guards? Uh, like any barrier, you don't have any barriers. So I, I would say they need to continue entering the bus from the rear. I mean, how do you, you you're gonna monitor who gets on with a face mask? I mean, citywide, they've been told 
you know, everybody's been told to wear a face mask, but then it was, you know, there is no enforcement. So I would, I would say that, you know, can't we call over there and, and you know, as a health and safety risk, they need to be uh, allowing passengers to enter from the rear of the bus. And I don't know, I, mean, I, 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 I guess this is a question, I don't know if this is from Miss Lemons or who, but when I was hearing about them entering from the rear of the bus, that's a little intimidating also, because you don't really know who's getting on. Well, you know, though, Alderman Howard, what your first statement, I agree with, I wonder if we should get the health commissioner mm -hmm. to declare that people, because he's the one that can actually declare right. it, that people can't board the, the and, and, and having said that. It's an emergency situation, they need to continue. I mean, we're on a spike now, they're saying, and it's like, why do we put, I mean, we need the public transportation because people need to get to their jobs. But at the same time, the the bus drivers shouldn't be subjected to this. It, it's terrible. It's it's scandalous, and uh, you know, being shot at. Uh, uh, it's it's an untenable situ situation. I would request or you know provide uh, information and maybe ask the health commissioner to write a letter to by state. Uh, I, I think he can declare it. I'm, I'm asking you. I'm not saying. I, but it seems to me, you might be right. The health commissioner can declare, like he's declared that the parks can't, you can't use this, you can't do right. that. The, and I, when I go downtown, know, I'm gonna make sure, you know, I like that idea. I like your thought. Okay, and then the other issue is their, their personal safety. Um, you know, that's, you know, when you look at Metrolink, they do have security, but it doesn't, and, and I don't, I wish I had the answer to that because I think we could solve a lot of problems in the city because we have, you know, public safety right now is, it's wild, wild west in many ways that, you know, the, the people are just, and I, I, I wish I could have an answer. I have people calling me saying, what's going on? They're shooting here. They're shooting there. I, I, I don't know. It's a sad state of affairs. Um, you know, a big social problem that we all need to face and, and figure out our piece and our part deal with it. Um, but I would say at the minimum, let's let's request the health commissioner to intervene and see if he would call over at by state and ask them to allow them to let the people get on the bus from the rear again. I'm gonna do that. Okay. I'm gonna be downtown at 2.30 in the mayor's office. I'm not okay. going to ask them. I'm going to tell them. That that, right, yes, tell that. them that we, we, we demand that. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that they should declare a health risk. And as long as it's a health risk. And again, bus drivers have died. And um, well, that, that's actually a great suggestion. I wasn't even thinking about it. Good suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, Alderman Tamika Hubbard, your thoughts? I hope she's here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and member of, of the committee. Uh, I agree with the sentiments of uh, Alderwoman Howard. I think that that will be the initial step because um, Dr. Eccles definitely has the power uh, to do that. And then, in addition to that, I think it would be good for us to offer a resolution as well to let them know that we are unified in support of uh, the drivers uh, for their safety and for the safety of the riders on the bus. And that's all I have, thank you. Okay, if you guys, if, if anybody on this can get me the wording of how you want the resolution to say, we're there. I'm gonna uh, jump backwards up to, because uh, I seem to skip over them all the time. Uh, Vice Chairman Jeffrey Boyd. Oh, you can't, I can't hear you, Jeff. You got to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say I um, appreciate our drivers. I know quite a few people who are bus drivers with Metro. Uh, thank you for what you do. You, you deal with the public in ways that um, is unimaginable sometimes. And so I just want to salute you for that because I know you guys put up with a lot of stuff. It's never your fault um, as far as, you know, situations and other people's situations. So I just want to salute you and thank you, you know, for taking on that profession. And I would definitely be supporting a co-sponsor and a resolution uh, on this issue. Thank you. We're going to go now, if Alderman 
Hit, are you with us? I know he was in his car with us, so he might be he might be going to another meeting. All the woman Pam Boyd suggestions, thoughts. I think we got some good thoughts though. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess my question, because I was listening to you guys, do you all have uh, you know, everybody now has the plexiglass or whatever in at the uh where they in dealing with customers. So do you all have that uh, at your seat? If I can answer. Yeah. Uh, I'll answer uh, Alderman Boy. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Pam. What we have, they have did some makeshift plexiglass shields. However, uh, those shields are only, they, they, they're partially covered. We've had in the last two weeks, I had to leave, I'm headed now to view a tape. We've had two female operators assaulted sexually through those glasses. We've had one that was um, filled, that, that the guy just filled her, was touching her. And then we had a, another that a guy had pinned her in between that glass and the window of the bus where she had to escape the bus and abandon the bus. So we're not, we, we appreciate the glass, but the glass is not, um, it's more like a spit shield. Okay. It's not to protect them. Yeah, it doesn't keep them from all the particles of COVID or the attacks. And see what I'm fearful of, because people said about them coming from the back, and you all don't have security on the bus, so I'm fearful of your safety from them coming up from the rear. And so to me, they kind of have you in a bad situation because if they come through the front, you know, you subject to being exposed and they come from the back, then like you said, with these incidents and something else can happen. And so I support what uh, uh, Tamika Hubbard, uh, our woman Hubbard and Shameen Hubbard are doing. But I just think we need to put more pressure on them to protect their employees because I just don't feel that's a priority to them. And, and I agree, uh, Alderman. However, with the boarding from the back, it minimizes the, the, contact, the contact and the conflict with customers. Because if they're boarding from the back, our primary task is we're not fair enforcement and we're not to, to, to police the bus. So the only thing we want to do is to drive the bus safely. Putting them in the front door only puts the, the only gives the, the driver less ability to move or maneuver away from any situation that could be occurring. Okay. All right. I was just concerned because I, I just feel like that opens you up more. But I, I support the resolution and whatever we need to do as in unity to support it, to put pressure to get you all the protection you need, I support it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I just wonder how expensive it would be to put heavy plexiglass, like bulletproof, around the driver. Uh, all the we, Joe, Joe, I'm sorry. Joe, we probably could have got more expensive plexiglass had they not bought those $10,000 uh, metal detectors to police the employees versus making sure that we were safe with their CARES Act money. Well, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. You're, you know, and we're going to, we're going to be, all the let women. Me, let, me, oh. let, me, let me say this too. Oh, go ahead. Reggie. Um, uh, what what they done was partially did what they were supposed to do because when they first went to put these shields out there, there was supposed to be a second part of that where they were supposed to put a barrier that would keep people from coming forward past past uh, the first set of the seats. So now it seems like what they've done is, is forgot about that and just leaving that that little uh, shield like she's saying up there and not putting this barrier up there to where once you got past there, you know once once you board come on the bus from the rear and get off on the rear, you couldn't walk up forward toward the operator anyway. So now we get going into what she's going to look at right now. Instead of them continuing on, I guess they feel like, okay, we've done enough. They have not done enough. You know, if you're going to put a barrier up there to keep people from coming to the front, put a barrier up there. You know, because we have to protect that operator. Because Can most I? of the time, most of the time when people, when, when these guys, when people come and assault people is when they're getting off the bus, not getting on the bus. All the women, Howard. 
We're, uh, we're going to come over to you in a minute, Shannon. Was there somebody else? Had yeah, well, the other woman, she, she mean Clark Hubbard. Let her go ahead. I can ask okay. later. I mean, I'll, I'll She's always got her. such a nice smile. I don't feel threatened. Okay. <laughs> I already asked, so let her. Uh, all the woman, Clark Hubbard. You're up. I think you're freezing a little bit. You're, you're muted. All the woman Hubbard. I think she's got because she's usually got a big smile, and I think the picture's freezing. I think she's frozen. Yeah, I think so too. All the woman Clark Hubbard, can you hear us? Or do you want to try to? Can we somehow re get her established better? STL people. Only thing she can do is move to a better signal or, you know, you know uh, disconnect and come back. Um, I, I guess she's oh. gonna try that. So uh, while we're waiting for her to come back. Uh, I just had a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so the reason now when they had the people entering from the back of the bus was the fare suspended at that time in other words people weren't paying that's yeah. correct miss lemons okay that is correct so, okay so they have uh, the fare boxes up there by you um do they pay with they actually pay with coin with with um cash at that particular cash. time i they pay with cash now, but as of June the 1st, but it had been suspended, um, I, I believe like in early, uh, the end of March mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. June the 1st. And you know, you, you you have a lot of, now that it's hot, you have the air conditioning mm -hmm. and they talk about the circulation of how mm -hmm. that recycling air and it can also uh, affect the driver as well as the passengers. It's, well, you know, it's the catch-22. So the reason they changed it was about the money is what my, my direction with that was. Yeah. All, with the, that all the woman, Howard, the fare, what they did was they came back with a fare, but the fare was only a dollar. And if you look at Metro's annual budget, their fare box brings in less than 10% of their annual revenue. And that's okay. the point that we've continued to make to them is that they have the ability to put a scavenger box, which is just a manual box. Oh. They could attach to that rear door and operate Metro bus as they operate Metro LRV, which is Metro right. uh, Metro Lane yeah. on the honor system and keep that conflict and that customer contact away from the drivers. Because for every driver touching 100 people, every one person that comes on there, that 100 people, that, that, that person is touched by that 100 people and that driver is touched by everybody they've touched. So it just, it, to us, it just makes and no sense. No, I just, it was just a question that I, I wanted a little better understanding. And it, what you're telling me is there's no reason. None. And uh, and if they operate Metrolink with no, you know, a voluntary system with no turnstiles, no that I, that's what I was trying to just get a little bit better understanding of why they changed it. And that's what I heard they were going to start charging again. But you know, like you said, they don't they don't make that much off of the fare. So what's so? And they could put the voluntary boxes back there, which probably wouldn't be very expensive. Uh, okay. They, they are they already have possession of the scavenger boxes. They uh -huh. put them out originally when they when they stopped the fare because they were handing out fare tickets. So they were using them during the back door entry. They were just only using them for tickets. We then went to Metro and asked them, can you affix those, the scavenger box, which are the manual fare boxes to the rear door entry and let them operate on the honor system. We're not asking for it permanently. We're just asking for it through this COVID. Right. And then with, I, them, with, with them reducing the fare, it puts another, it puts the drivers at another, another conflict. Disadvantage. Yes, yes. I get it. Yes. I get it. It puts you in, a, in the crosshairs again and being, yeah, subject to asking for money. And, you know, you, I, I, we're working in a time when people are so. On edge. Yeah. 
on edge. And yes. It's, and the and the and with that, it, it's raising the assaults. And it's that clear we it's documented. And I don't understand why it's taken so much for us to get metro public sector just to keep the community safe. I, I, I see, okay. I see all the women Clark Hubbard got back in. Okay. Uh, in case her her thing goes out. Sh Shmeen Clark Hubbard, are you there? Might have went out on her again. She's having problems because of the storm. She texted me. Uh, it says, I, I am in support of whatever we do collectively uh, in support of them. And, 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 you know, and, and they continue to put their lives on the line. Um, I'll just briefly go over what I thought and then we could probably sort of ramp this up. But um, we talked about how long it takes the police to come on about June the 1st. Um, you know, but, but I think that the two things that I think, well, the one big thing that I think are two things is uh, all the women Howard's and I, I will do that. I'm going to be in city hall in an hour anyway, to ask the commissioner to declare, to declare a health emergency and that people could only board the back of the bus. And, and, uh, I will put that on the mayor. And, and the health director to do that. Uh, I will also, in a resolution, we could talk about that, but I'm hoping we could fix that before the resolution. In the resolution, I think we need to ask about um, hazard pay for drivers, not even, even, not even if, you know, they've been shot at, but, just the idea of what they're doing. And uh, in the resolution, uh, pretty much demand that they put that barrier up to keep people from approaching the front, maybe put it two, one or two rows back that no one can approach the front of the bus. Um, and, and that's my thoughts. And uh, if everybody could please just chime in, uh, that's my thoughts. And if there's more to it, We'll do more. But well, Mr. Chairman, I like to offer that when, when you prepare the resolution, you have every right to ask Metro to appear before the committee and have conversations with the decision makers. Um, they get funded by the city of St. Louis, so I don't think they would be very resistant at wanting to appear before the committee and talk about public health. Would so that's do? just my suggestion is you do your resolution, you can call upon um, whoever we need to call upon, the, the, the director, um, forgot who it is, but the director and whoever else is involved in bus driver safety. Also, uh, who else can appear is uh, who's ever representing the union can appear and voice their concern. I'm sorry I, if I missed someone here is representing the union. Did I oh, miss yeah. that? Ronald, Ronald Howard. He's uh, okay. Not he's only is he okay. one of my ex All right. But but he's welcome to come back too. So, um, so would you, would you think that uh, you'd want to try to do this for Thursday's meeting? I don't think the resolution could be prepared for Thursday, which means it'll be Friday. I, I I don't think you need to rush it right away. I mean, I understand this is a public health crisis, but if you want to craft it in a way that it can be most impactful, we could you know we could schedule a meeting on Tuesday. Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm those just my that. thoughts. No, I'm open for that. And I, I would hope that the different, like if you would help put the resolution together, uh, I, I'd like everybody's impact. Now I am gonna go and try to declare it a health emergency with the health director and, and basically instantly stop the boarding of the buses from the front and the barriers. I mean, I, I think our resolution is good to show we're united in this. And I believe you're right, that we need to have those people in here to show them we're serious. But I do think that the health director has the authority to mandate this and, and mandate it starting within a day. And maybe I'm wrong, but that, that's my understanding. No. Jeff, you're still muted. I'm sorry. No, I think it's worth having a conversation with the mayor's office and the health director, certainly. Okay. Okay. Um, and I don't mean to be calling people by their first name, but Alderman Howard. 
Uh, yes. No, just wondering if you had any other thing that you wanted to input. No, I agree with uh, Alderman Boyd. I think w it would be good to get those people in front of the committee and uh, uh, the uh, operators, the, the executives from Metro. And, uh, and let, let me say this, if we craft the resolution and we get resistance, and we include those things such as hazard pay, uh, maybe we should send it to them and see what their response is. If we get it, I don't know that there's any need if, I don't know, I would, I would defer to Mr. Howard, um, would there be need for further conversation if we get what we ask them for? Well, I, I, I agree. I think if we can get the health director to do his thing, mm -hmm. and if we can get the hazard pay and get them to agree to it, then we've accomplished what I believe we need to for the immediate. Uh, 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 Mr. Howard, do you agree with that? Do you get him to, you, you, you talking and speaking in, in terms about the rear door entry? So yeah, if we can get the rear door entry right away, and okay. if we can get the, the barrier to keep them from coming close to the front from the back, and by resolution, if we can get the hazard pay for all the drivers, is that pretty much settled what we're shooting? Is that the goal we're shooting for? I would say uh, yes. Okay. Um, moving forward, yes. I think I would think that would be, be very helpful. Well, that's gonna be our goal. I'm gonna talk to the mayor and the public safety director, see if they won't cut, you know, declare a health emergency and instantly fix where people are getting on and off the bus. I think on the resolution where we are going to ask for hazard pay and if we can get all this done, if they resist, then I think we, we need to, uh, you know, basically get them in and, you know, let them know that we're, we're, we're not going to just stand by and let this happen. So, um, um, but that so that's our that's our goal as a committee, and and I see that all the women Clark Hubbard is, is back with us. She got the best smile. She just does. Did, did did you have anything you want to add? As we're jumping around. Here? No, I'm okay. I'm I'm in support of all the work that we're doing to help help them. Uh, again, like I said, moving forward as they continue to put their lives on the line. So please add me, let me know what we can do to support. And I definitely think that we should be reaching out to them as well when crafting the resolution. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all the women, Pam Boyd, are, are, I, I know you're there somewhere. Uh, yeah, I'm here, uh, Mr. Chair. It's just a question that came across my mind because I know that you all, uh, what are the shifts that you work? Our shifts vary. We start out, our earliest run starts out at uh, signs at three o'clock and the last one pulls in, I think at right 10 minutes after two. Okay. So do you work eight hours, 12 hours? Well, we're working. Our board, we have uh, what's called an extra board. They work from anywhere from 10, 10 to 15 hours. And then uh -huh. we have eight hour runs, which since through this COVID, they actually went in and cut the runs based on uh, just us asking them to minimize exposure. So they, what they've done is they've cut the runs all to 40 hour runs. But our okay. extra people can work 10 to 15 hours a day, depending on uh, the shortfall of manpower. And so, and so my question is, uh, do they, and it, it might sound crazy, but do they do any kind of sanitizing, disinfecting of the bus before, after <laughs> hours, or whatever? That's one, that's been one of our biggest fights. We know that they have, they've told us that they've had CARES Act, they've tried to ramp up the cleaning, but we're constantly out here fighting every day to make sure these buses are clean. We, uh, they were supposed to use the CARES Act money to, put out mobile cleaners. Um, we've seen one or two here or there, but that's another fight that we're constantly, you know, on them about. And what their excuse is that they're giving us is just like we're being hard hit, the cleaning industry is being hard hit. But we continue to explain to them that, you know, we understand that, but at the same 
token, you know, we have to keep the public and the drivers safe. So the cleanliness of the buses in the beginning, they ramped it up. We weren't 100% happy with it, but, you know, we keep talking about it, but we can use some help in that department too. And I thought about that because I was, my thinking was you have different types of people. You don't know how their hygiene practices are. And so you all are exposed to them. So I was like, well, how are they sanitizing? Because most places they'll show you where they wipe seats down and spread, but I'm hearing that's not happening on a regular basis. So that's a concern to me. And uh, Chair, that's something probably needs to be discuss with the health commissioner because he needs to make sure that that's a part of that. And I, I'm, I'm gonna be there at 2.30 and uh, at the mayor's office and this is gonna be the, the, the number, number one topic. And I, I think she'll agree with all this. I, I, I just think it seems too, too obvious and too normal not to agree. Right. You know, I, I'm not getting on a bus. You know, um, you know, um, and, and I know I've jumped all over the place. Am I missing anyone or any last comments? It's, I think we got it pretty wrapped up. Uh, Vice Chairman Boyd, I really would appreciate your help as well, and as well as uh, all the women Howard and Boyd and. Clark Hubbard, um, collectively, I would like some help with that resolution, uh, or at least get your thoughts in. Uh, and I'll know more later today when I get out of that meeting at the mayor's office. What I'm hoping is, is the, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Eccles will declare it a health issue and say it until this COVID thing is resolved or, the, or at least until they come up with a, a, a vaccine that we have to continue to do this in the city of St. Louis. I don't know what we can do about the county, but we certainly have the right to enforce things in the city and for the safety of our constituents that ride the bus as well as the bus drivers. So uh, if anyone else has closing comments, if not, Yes, Shemeen, did you have a... I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time out and, and um, to hear them and giving them this platform. And before, since we don't know if you'll be able to speak with Ms. Ms. Wilson or Mr. Howard before you go into the mayor's office. Ms. Wilson, can you just tell um, Autumn and Vaccaro, our chairman, the how many people you have in your union? And so then when he goes in, he'll know who he's speaking for. We have right at we were right at about right at about two thousand a little over two thousand members three with our retirees so we just thank you for taking out the time to support us and anything that you could do is greatly appreciated again we just thank you for your time and your I'm, effort. I'm hoping to have some good answers for you today and what you mean she looks nice but she hits hard and. <laughs> I, I'm not going to try to <laughs> just kidding. She makes, you know, what's funny though, this is true. I, whenever I vote a way that she probably prefers, I wouldn't vote. She doesn't yell at me, but I can just tell she gets quiet and she's, she's like, you can tell she's not happy with what I, when I vote so much. Right. And that, that hurts me more than if she did hit me because I really do like her. She's so nice. Um, so, uh, is, is Reginald Howard still with us? No, he might have, he may have had to leave or the thunderstorm got him. I wanted him to tell everybody how poor of a no. teacher I was. That's pretty bad. Uh, anyway, so uh, we'll look for a motion to adjourn and I'm going to head downtown. So move to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay, well, well thank you all. And, and, and by state, thank you for being so patient. Mm -hmm. Coming right, toward the you. end of all this mess. Yeah. God bless you. Hey, oh, there he is there. Yeah, Let you know how bad was that? That's pretty bad, wasn't it? Oh, uh, he's pretty he's okay, Joe. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I <laughs> when you said you 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 were my teacher, I was wanting to run and hide under a table because <laughs> I, I I was no teacher. I was <laughs> anyway. 
God bless y'all. The meeting's adjourned. And and uh, if you want to call me later, I I should have. I'm going to the mayor's office at two thirty, and hopefully might have some answers by four. Okay, I'll give you a call later. Okay, God bless. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Shamine. Thanks, Tamika. Okay.